It's time for Push to Play, your weekly trophy podcast with Mindy and CJ. Welcome and thank you for joining us to episode 18 of Push to Plat. What an exciting show for you we have this morning. Well, it's incredibly early here in Australia this morning for my co-host Cassandra. How are you today, Cassandra? Cassandra? <laughs> I thought I'd throw that in because you've been playing so much Assassin's Creed. Oh, uh, uh, yes, I it? see. And here, <laughs> and here I thought maybe it was because... Uh, the uh, other person also has a C name, so I thought maybe you were calling me Cassandra oh. with C. You think I went totally Ooh. off the book in the first 30 seconds? I like it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, you know, this is not my first time at the podcast rodeo. I, uh, I have a sense of how you work now. That's true, Sassity. Thank you. And let's introduce our wonderful guest from the I UK. Hate you. <laughs> let's introduce our wonderful <laughs> guest today from the UK. Chris, how are you doing today, sir? I'm good, thank you. It's uh, great to be here on, on this show. <laughs> What's the name of the show, Chris? Push to Platt. <laughs> I know there it. we go. I know it. I've been on before. <laughs> We're all on the so, same page. So, listeners, listeners, uh, true confession time here. Chris, uh, Chris is a friend of mine. He currently, um, well, he's he's kind of, kind of all over the place, as uh, as CJ might say. <laughs> Chris and I used to work for, uh, well, quote work uh, <laughs> for a, a website that no longer exists now. It was called Nukezilla. And uh, it, was. it was just a gaming, you know, one of the millions at the time of gaming websites that were trying to cover news and reviews and and make it. And, and some of them worked and some of them didn't. And ours is one of the ones that didn't. But I think we had some fun while yeah, we were there. I, I really and enjoyed that, actually. Site, the site founder uh, eventually went on to, um, what's that show called? Shark Tank. And uh, he won, I guess. I, do you win Shark Tank? They either decide to give you money or don't. So I guess he, he, got, he got offers from everyone uh, for running a bespoke dating software yeah. or dating apps. Uh, and I think he, he did so well that he eventually, like after the show, turned it all down because he had such huge investment from elsewhere. Yeah. So uh, he's, I think he's one of he's the doing, people He's to, doing pretty well for himself. Well. Yeah. I, th- I think he's, uh, he's doing I well. Still, I still chat with him from time to time. Not as much as I used to, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, nice play. So it's it's kind of like it's kind of like getting the band back together, and and uh, now we're we're at the high school reunion and awkwardly talking about people we used to know. <laughs> uh, I like Chris, that. Chris was one of the ones that stuck around. <laughs> uh, Chris, yeah, never left. <laughs> Chris, would you like to give us a little bit of like background info on on yourself and your gaming? Uh, yeah, of course. I mean. Uh, these days, I'm you know in my early thirties now, so I, I play games as much as I can fit around my other schedule because I'm a I'm a teacher full time, so I, I teach art and photography, uh, and then in my spare time, I still play a lot of games. Growing up, like games have always been this big, big thing for me, and I think as I was getting older, more and more people sort of shifted away, either kind of like just you know got into other stuff or, or moved away from gaming as a hobby, and I just sort of doubled down uh, as I've got older and older. It's it's one of these things that just keeps me going. Games is always in the background. And in the last year or so, I started doing my own podcast, which we we might mention later, called R3 Cents, uh, with two of my friends, where basically we compiled a list of our 100 favorite games of all time from our whole lifetimes. And each week, talk about kind of one of the lists in in ascending order, starting from 100, moving up to one gradually. Uh, And it's been really fun to kind of hear, you know, from two other people that have had the same experience, that have really used games as something that's run through their whole lifetime. Uh, and it's it's just been really fun to kind of hear people talk passionately about stuff. And I mean, I think, you know, even this is this is predominantly like a, a PlayStation Trophies podcast, obviously. I think it's nice listening to both of you when you talk about games. You know, you might you might be talking about kind of the, the trophy whore type stuff or, or easy platinums and things like that. But equally, you often talk about games that you have real reverence for. And and I really like just hearing anyone talk passionately about something. And and I think it's really nice that I've gradually found more and more people in games that are still interested as they get older. 
because there's hundreds of people out there, but they're just they're not always that vocal about it, I suppose. So it's it's nice. I hope of, I hope I hope it's more than yeah, hundreds. Yeah. I really do. Yeah, this is this is kind of like reverse hyperbole, isn't it? So <laughs> saying, oh, there's ten or twenty or so. <laughs> yeah, no, there's there's millions of people out there. There's like yeah. there's like five. But know? yeah, I, I don't think people are always that open about it. I, I think gaming still has like a a little bit of a stigma around it. Yeah. At least, at least in terms of like using it as a real hobby, like something you really enjoy and, and you know get real pleasure from. Uh, so yeah, it's it's just nice to talk to people that like games. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, look, I, did, I have to ask because I also work in the in the education field as well. Sometimes with the lovely children. Yeah. Do you? Do, <laughs> yes. Do you um? Do you find being a gamer like? Do they know? Do you have any crossover? Like any more connection? Do you think with them because of that, or do you do you keep that completely separate? Or I think. I think sometimes I'll bring it up when I think it's relevant. And I think most kids I teach are kind of aware that I'm interested in games in, in some sense. Yeah. But I think in the same way that when I was kind of that age at school, I, I, I just wanted to play something like Grand Theft Auto or whatever was kind of like the mature game. Mm. And and these days kids are, you know, they're, they're still dead into Fortnite. Yeah. Fortnite's still absolutely huge for the, the kids I teach. FIFA every year uh, with kind of the ultimate team stuff and all those microtransactions. And it's kind of, even though it is gaming, it's it's something I'm part of. It feels like a very different avenue within gaming. Yeah. Uh, and they've got they've got no interest when I want to talk about old stuff. Yeah, I was, I was going to say I don't think you I don't think you play any of the like you don't play Call of Duty, you don't play Grand Theft Auto, oh. you don't play Fortnite <laughs> or Overwatch. Like there there is no <laughs> crossover with you, is there? Yeah, so that's what I mean. So that's why it's, it's such a broad church, I suppose you'd say in in gaming. That sort of mainstream gaming or, or what is kind of most accessible to young kids certainly is not necessarily the stuff that I get any enjoyment from uh, so you know I, I kind of appreciate that you know that there'll be some kids in there that will play something else and might go on and find other stuff later but the way the industry is set up now certainly with the kind of um, you know the, the games as a service type thing that that stuff like Fortnite is doing I think kids have a very different relationship with games that a lot of their time is either spent on that type of thing where it's just like a free-to-play thing that's constantly refreshing content or like mobile stuff in the same way that it's just whatever is kind of in vogue, whatever sort of faddy thing has come out. So games, as I like them in terms of like full experiences or weird stuff or interesting stuff is not really on their radar, I guess. Yeah, that's cool. Now, I, you mentioned that we are sort of a PlayStation podcast. I mean, I don't know what we really are. Do we? Do we, Mindy? We, we change weekly, but <laughs> but you're not uh, you're not console exclusive, are you? So you play everything. Is that is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm quite open. I mean, the only console I don't have these days from kind of the you know the recent time is I I did have an Xbox One uh, closer to kind of launch, and then it got to a point where I found that everything that was multi platform I was buying on the on the PS4. So I, I sold my Xbox One a couple of years ago and I, I haven't really had anything to pull me back in yet. There's kind of, I, I've got a little list of exclusives that I would like to be able to play again. Well, it would be a very little list, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, this is the thing. <laughs> Outside of like, you know, you've got Halo and Forza and, and yeah. those kind of big names. Yeah. There's really nothing much to, to pull me in. Uh, and again, the stuff that I'm kind of most interested in, I think primarily, uh, you know, I play on either the PS4 or, or the Switch as, as kind of the main consoles these days. Yeah, oh, it's good. Some Switch love. Excellent. Uh, now, I also, we should we should mention your wonderful podcast that you're on, uh, R3 Cents, uh, a retro gaming podcast. So I, I've just recently started listening, thanks to a referral from Mindy. And can I just say, I'm amazed at the knowledge the three of you have on games. <laughs> it, it's, it's very <laughs> impressive. <laughs> So I assume that just comes from a lifetime of playing, as you were saying. You just—I I mean, I think so. Yeah, I mean, we, we put together these lists, like I said, of our, our hundred favorite games, and each week in kind of prep, I might do, I might replay something quickly, or I might kind of dive back in. But generally, this is just—I feel like I've—I've I've been so entrenched in games my whole life yeah. that for the, for the most part, it doesn't matter what they bring up, I've got some sort of knowledge of, like a working knowledge of, of most games. Yeah, uh, and I think that's something we'll, we'll probably touch on later as well. Just this idea of. Um, you know, wanting to know about everything within the industry and within <laughs> games that's never really left. I know, I know what that's like. Yeah, Chris, Chris knows where the skeletons are buried. <laughs> so uh, th- just before we before we move on i also want to ask because i did reach out to you guys on facebook uh earlier this week and ask because this fascinates me so you actually set the the list of 100 games before you started didn't you you're, you're not sort of going we yeah week to week yeah so, so we had kind of a rule that we we talked about wanting to do something whether it was going to be a video project or a podcast project or, or just like a written thing. But I had this idea that I wanted to kind of know what people were interested in. And this idea of having like a numerical list was a really easy format to kind of latch onto. Um, but because obviously, you know, I, I play stuff every week, as, as do they. 
um, we kind of said the rule was, okay, once you've made your list, once those hundred are on there, it's kind of set in stone. So if you've forgotten something too bad, yeah. if someone else <laughs> you, brings something else lock, that, yeah. you know, that you should have had on there, it's just, you just have to live with it. Mm. And equally, like, like you mentioned, lots of good stuff comes out in the year, or I might play some old stuff I'd never touched upon earlier. Yes. Um, but I think we'll probably cover kind of when we finish the project, the, the kind of honorable mentions that we have either found over over the course of doing the project or or stuff that we've since played that we've, we've really enjoyed or, yeah, or whatnot. Yeah, that's good. See, and Mindy as well. This is a really clever idea because they have a topic instruction now for every episode for like 100 episodes. We should, we should have thought about something <laughs> like that. These guys know what they're doing, you know. <laughs> Well, they, you know, they've been doing it a little longer than we true. have, haven't well, they? That's true. That's true. Resolute perfectionist now. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Because you're, you guys are, you guys are, uh, you're not quite halfway done, but you're getting there, right? It is moving along quite quickly. I think in terms of us recording, we're we're a couple of weeks ahead of what is published. Um, so we're we're approaching like we're, we're... To take. We need to uh, get on that. Yeah. <laughs> Before Final Fantasy fourteen comes out, and I lose you for like three months. <laughs> To be honest, since we've started doing this, I have been looking around at other podcasts that have set themselves up to pre-record without weekly content, and it's a very clever move. I never considered it at the time, but <laughs> I think it is a it's a very intelligent move <laughs> across the thing. But something we should do because I know at the start of of every episode, and let, let's be honest, that we'd be halfway through Chris's podcast by now, so he's almost done. <laughs> uh, <laughs> at the start, they have a quiz, and of course, that like I don't know any of the games that they're talking about most of the time, and they're so quick, like most of the time the question's not even asked and they have the answer or, or finished i should say so i thought we could do our own little quiz this Ooh. morning oh no uh, for you both. but this will be no it'll be a little bit different we're gonna do it's gonna be a retro quiz but it's gonna be on trophy names so I, i'm not sure that chris is at an advantage here <laughs> at all <laughs> let's be real i'm not so sure i am either but okay well look i'm not either so and i've got the answers in front of me so we, we'll see how we go so well, that's because we have, you don't play more than five percent of every game that's ever come out well that's true that's true that's my, my favorite game changes weekly so as you know mindy so <laughs> so let's uh we've got i made them multiple choice questions okay. so i thought that would that would give us a bit of a, a better thing and i'm borrowing a little bit of an idea from the ign beyond podcast they seem to have abandoned it so i'll pick it up until they uh they pick it back up or send a cease and desist letter either way uh either way we'll see what happens there so uh our first game I thought so what what I did was I took what I would classify as sort of early uh, PS1 or uh, PS2 retro the star games and they had to have been re-released on the PS3 or PS4 uh, so the the name of the trophy will be from the re-released version okay so here we okay. go so the f first game and, and maybe I mean you're both fountains of knowledge on this we'll start with Sly Cooper and the Theavis Raccoonus for PS2 so any ideas this is not the question but I'm just interested any ideas when this came out do you know the year? Uh, the original, if it was PS2, I'm going to guess it was around 2001. I, I, I was going to say one or two. Very, very good. 2002. Yeah, oh. September, September 23rd. Very good, yeah. Uh, and developed by our Sucker Punch production. So the PS3 release came out on November 9th, 2010, and then the beloved beta uh, in 2014. So the trophy description, I'll give you the description, and then I'll give you four choices for the possible name. So the description is, it's the first trophy you would acquire. It's Enter the World of Sly Cooper. So option A, the trophy is called Raccoonus Delitus. B, Journey Forth, Raccoonus One, C, Sucker Punched, or D, Sly's First Steps? Uh, I think it's Sly's First Steps. Then I'll, I'll be contrary. I'll say B, because that also sounded like an early one. <laughs> Raccoon, I like that. It's actually C, Sucker Punched. Does they it? put their own name into a trophy. Oh. Isn't that fantastically egocentrical? <laughs> I love that. Hey, that, sound, that sounds more like a trophy you get for like the first time you die. Yeah, getting like no, yeah, in yeah, the back of the head. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think it works on multiple levels. It's like, sucker, you gave us your money. <laughs> we'll punch you back oh, and enter I'll, the first you know, world. I'll bet, I'll bet you I'm just awful, and, and that's actually the name of the platinum, isn't it? No, that's the first trophy. first steps. Yeah. Oh, no, I don't know. No, I, I don't know. I think I just made that one up. Yeah, I, I quite like that. What is it? Okay. The Thievis Raccoonus? Yeah, Thievis Raccoonus. I'm if not only, sure if only... If only Google wasn't a thing that existed. Yes, no cheating, please. I should have said that before we started. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so on to game two. So the, wow, this is a throwback here. Wipeout. So where do you when do you think Wipeout appeared? Oh, I, that is not my genre. I think that's like year one for the PlayStation. So I'm trying to think when the PS1 launched. Mm. Um, 2064. <laughs> 
Uh, oh, 90, 94. Oh, so close. 95. 95. Oh. Uh, 29th of September, 1995. And uh, MS-DOS uh, on PC as well at the same time. So let's have a look. So it released, uh, so we've had a couple, haven't we? So it released on PS3 on the 25th of September, 2008. And then we had the Wipeout Amiga collection on PS4 in 2017. So they're getting uh getting some replayability there on that one aren't they so okay here we go so for now this is the platinum name mindy so you're going to have no idea because this is a racing game so (laughs) this is going to be a real guess for you earn all the trophies in the game excluding additional content trophies don't you love it when the platinum has such a great great description anyway the first one a is wipe off b is transcendence c is i can fly i can fly and d this is wipe out i'm going for b um let's let's say let's say D again. I'm probably wrong. Not a bad guess, Mindy. So D, this is Wipeout was actually the plot name for the Vita version. Ah. Uh, Wipeout 2048. <laughs> so Transcendence Ooh, is correct. And it's geez. actually the name for all the re-release as well on PS4, uh, the Transcendence too. Yeah. That's a very good game. I don't know if either of you have played Ooh. that or if that's uh, I I've played the uh, the VR version of the Omega mm. Collection. Mm. Um not on my account. I, I played it at a friend's house, but it's it's very good. It is good, yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, on to question three. Oh, I grade my teeth at this series. Mega Man. When did? Yay! <laughs> when did Mega Man appear, Mindy? Um, this is before. Uh, uh, late, late eighties, eighty seven, eighty eight. Wow, this is scary. I'm glad one of us has. Am knowledge. I de- am I dead? Am I dead wrong? No, you're 100 percent right. 1987. Yeah, well done. Ah, Fantastic, wow. isn't that crazy? We, you know, the the scary thing is we would have all been alive then too. <laughs> okay, thanks for that. <laughs> but probably, probably most of our many of our listeners may not have been. Uh, <laughs> developed developed <laughs> developed by Capcom, uh, and then of course we had multiple re-releases. So this one comes from the Mega Man Legacy Collection. Uh, from 2015, which was only a hundred percent game. Do you imagine putting yourself through that for a hundred percent? It's a big old game, isn't it? A, a it is, old, yeah. No, those those the legacy trophy lists are awful. I liked the uh, the X the X uh, Mega Man X re release trophy lists because not so much that they had platinums because they clearly mm-hmm. had fun with mm. the trophy list, as mm-hmm. opposed to just beat the game, beat the game without dying. You know. Did you play this one, Mindy? I thought you might have. No, um, because it had those uh, like it had those challenge things to do, right? Like you had to earn so many gold medals. And I'm just my 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 Mega Man reflexes are not are just not there anymore. You know, I was really good at it when I was, you know, a lot younger. And I actually when I was in college, I had my PS2, which is how old I am. And um, I, I walked into a GameStop one day and they had the they had ported all of the Mega Man games, the original ones on the PS- PS2, the it? anniversary collection. Yeah. So I bought it and I was like, oh, I haven't played these games in years. This is awesome. And I took it, ho- it back to my dorm and I was terrible at it. Like I had all of my reflexes for the, I'm still, I'm still pretty good at the X games, but the, the um, original ones, I just, I, I think I've aged out yes. of it. Yes, well. <laughs> which is which is sad. <laughs> have you have you played these games, Chris? Are you a Mega Man fan? Or? Yeah, I, I have. Um, I have copies of the Legacy Collection uh, and the the second volume as well because they did That's it right. in two sets, didn't they? Like yeah. one. Yeah, they broke it up. It was uh, it was one in one through four on one and five through Whatever. seven. <laughs> I can't really remember. No, it included nine and ten, didn't it? The uh, oh, the, I'm sorry, the legacy. I'm thinking of the. I'm thinking of the X one. I'm sorry. Yeah, they they were slightly different. I don't because they yet. broke that. They broke that up into two as well. Yeah, I, I do own the legacy collection, though, even though I am terrible at these games. So I, I did pick it up. <laughs> Who would have thought, listeners, that Mega Man would have got this much time on this podcast? Not me, that's for sure. <laughs> so <laughs> let's get straight into the question so we can move on from it. Uh, stopped. Uh, so the the I think this is a uh, must be one of the early trophies. So stop doc. I will. I will sneak a Metroidvania expert off this podcast. <laughs> I will sneak that way. Uh, I, I, I might. St- I might start Bloodstain before that happens. Just give me. Give me. <laughs> give me a couple of hours warning. <laughs> That's all it will take, listeners. A couple of hours. Trust me. Question: Stop Doctor Wily's plans and complete the original Mega Man. Is that right, Doctor Wily? Is that his name? 
I hope so. Perfect. So, uh, A, the mystery of Dr. Wily. B, that's Mega Man to you. C, it's raining Mega Man. (laughs) Yes. And D, rock and roll. Which is the name for the trophy? I'm going to... I'm going to go for B. What's the, sorry, what's the trophy description? So it's stop Dr. Wily's plans and complete the original Mega Man. It's the mystery of Dr. Wily. That's Mega Man to you. It's raining Mega Man or rock and roll. Uh, yeah, I'm going to say that's, that's Mega Man to you. Mm, yes, rock, you're never going to. Rock would be about roll, his, his sister. Yes, well, you're never going to get that right because it is rock and roll. Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's bad at this. Yeah. Well, this is, this is, you'd think that that that's Mega Man U would be some sort of reference to playing like the Japanese version of it because he goes by Rock Man and not Mega Man. Yeah. yeah. Mm. You know, yeah. if it had a trophy, it... this is not, this is not a fun game. <laughs> It is fun for me. Uh, <laughs> if it had a trophy in it called It's Raining Mega Man, I would definitely play that game. So that, that's what they need to do for, what are they up to, 12 now, 11? It's still going, isn't it? It'll never end. Yeah, 11, 11 is pretty recent. Well, it's more, you're more likely to find fun names like that on the uh, on the uh, X anniversary ones because, like I said, they had fun excellent. with that list. Well, that's enough Mega Man for today and this year. So now question four. We have to throw something Final Fantasy in because it is such a big week for Final Fantasy, obviously, this week. So we've got a Final Fantasy twelve, a PS2 game originally. When? Damn. You couldn't, you couldn't have asked about no. seven or eight <laughs> not, or not nine. the most popular ones. <laughs> or 10 you had to talk about yes. 12. 12 was a late release as well wasn't it It was about 2005 on the it, it was late yeah it was uh later actually it was it was late i i feel like it was you're very close you're very close yeah like 2000 2006 yes 2005 split the middle 2006 yeah march 16 2006 by the wonderful square enix uh so we had the re-release for ps4 just recently uh in uh, july of 2017 now have either of you played this game in any of its forms i've never played no that's the other reason (laughs) excellent (laughs) well good one of the references will be lost on you here but anyway it doesn't matter uh so (laughs) the platinum trophy uh for this game uh, so collected all other trophies. Is it Champion of Ivalice, Master of the Gambit, Hey, It's Not an MMO, or Revenant Wings? Uh, Revenant I'm, Wings is one of the spin-off games. I know that. Yeah, yeah, Revenant Wings. Uh, I couldn't trick you. Do you know which spin-off game it was? <laughs> Revenant Wings was a, it was a DS game, wasn't it? It was, yeah. 2007, yeah, yeah. Nintendo DS. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go for A. I think, because uh, that's the the setting, isn't it? Is it Ivelisse yes, or Ivelisse or have you? Think? Yes, one of those. Yes. Well, I'm gonna, I'm uh, which gonna one pick would you like? B or, I'm going to pick B or C. So what was... what was uh... Uh, Master of the Gambit was B, and hey, it's not an MMO, is C. Yeah, let's go with B. Yes. <laughs> no, it is actually A. Yeah. yeah. The Gambit Ooh. system was the, the, the fighting system in the game, though. So, Mindy, so you were is, close. Is, um, is 12 the game where you, you kind of queue up? actions don't you yeah yeah so under- again, you, you almost sort of program your team to to carry out actions yeah that's right yeah yeah which is not as so- fun as it sounds <laughs> <laughs> So this, uh, this is what I mean about kind of having a working knowledge. I've never played the game, but I, I seem to know these little snippets of information. Yeah, look. It, so I've, I've, I've read and watched enough stuff over the years that it's just absorbed yeah. somehow into my brain. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? It's supposed to be a very good game. I have not played that one either, but it's, it's supposed to be good. And of course, see the reference. It's not an MMO. What is that a reference to, Mindy? Why would they say? I couldn't tell be? you. Really? You're not I familiar. I certainly. With- could- Final I Fantasy certainly, I certainly am not aware of the fact that Final Fantasy made an MMO game. Well, they, they made been going on for years. Yeah. I'm sure Chris could inform you. <laughs> 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 so, of course, Eleven was an MMO as well, and it you know the crazy yeah. thing it's still it's still going today. Is that it really? Is, it, can you? It is. Eleven, yeah. But yeah you, is it only by the PC now? I think they. I think so. They stopped like, yeah. the Xbox ones and things, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. I thought they. It? I yeah. thought they shut that all down when they launched fourteen. No, no, they they certainly have run in conjunction, but uh, yeah, I, I guess it might yes, still yeah. be going, but it, it was certainly going yeah. at some point. Fascinating. And look, we've got one more I forgot, so I don't know what the scores are. I think Chris is winning by uh, like four at the moment, so we'll, we'll just carry on to the last question. We're having fun. <laughs> well, I'm having fun anyway. And the last one, look, what a staple of PlayStation Resident Evil 2. When did this appear? Ooh. 
Uh, that was later than ninety-seven. I'm gonna I'm gonna say ninety-five. That was a really good year for PS One games. Like a really good year. Close. Uh, I'm gonna give Chris the point. He's closest. Ninety-eight. Uh, January twenty-first. Oh, nice. And, oh. uh, of course, re-released just recently, wasn't it? This year, uh, 2019 in January. Yeah, early this year. Fantastic. I don't know. Has, has anyone played the, the re, uh, remake? Not re-release, is it? Uh, re- I, I'm a big softie when it comes to uh, horror games. Uh, and even since Resident Evil's kind of got more action heavy, uh, I just I don't have the uh, the steel to play them. <laughs> it's fantastic. The this is one of these games that uh, like uh, I play a little bit on both Xbox and and PlayStation. And normally for the triple A's that the graphic uh, graphic difference is, is noticeable across the two systems. But in this game, uh, Capcom just hit it out of the park. It, it, it's one of the best looking games on on PlayStation uh, without a doubt, and also terrifying as mm. well. <laughs> yes, I enjoyed that first five minutes, Mindy. Fantastic. <laughs> so the trophy description here is. <laughs> Uh, so it's a, one of the early trophies and it's described as make it to the police station. So we have the first choice is head intact. B, Leon S. Kennedy reporting for duty. C, Night of the Walking Dead. Or D, Welcome to the City of the Dead. B. I'll just keep going B. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was it? Make it to the police station? Make it to the police station. Head intact, Leon S. Kennedy, reporting for duty, Night of the Walking Dead, or Welcome to the City of the Dead. I'm going to say D. I'm going to say Welcome to the City of the Dead. Are you sure you want to go with D? <laughs> you, you know what? It's, it's served me poorly this entire quiz, so let's stick with it. So I can't change your mind on D. No, I'm, I'm right, aren't I? You are right. (laughs) So look at that. Four to one. Congratulations, Mindy. You're on the board. (laughs) You know, I got, you know, I got a lot of those questions that had nothing to do with the quiz, right? Like when you You did things released except for Resident Evil 2, but okay. Yeah, you both did very well. And of course, Leon S. Kennedy, that's a good guess because he is one of the central characters. So, uh, not, yeah, not, I do know that. Yes, yeah, no, not despite, too far off. That's why I'm not playing it. I do know that. <laughs> I tell you what, if you do make it to the police station with your head intact the first time, you're doing well, though. There's a lot of zombies out the front of that thing. Anyway, yeah. let's let's move on. So that was a little bit of uh, that was a little bit of fun. Thank you for indulging me. How did you go, listeners? Did you get any right, or are you like me and you're uh, you're a child of the last few years of gaming? I don't. I want to know how many people were screaming at us when we got stuff wrong. Oh, look, yes, I mean they they would have got everything correct, you know, but that's that's how it is. You know. <laughs> they should be they should be hosting their own podcast, obviously. Uh, so <laughs> let's let's move on. So why don't we have a look at what we've been playing this week? And Chris, why don't we start with you? What have you What have you been playing? I have actually in in preparation for doing this podcast, I went back and, and played a lot of PS4 and Vita stuff and PS3. Actually, mm-hmm. I've, I've had like a, a trophy couple weeks. So even though Mario Maker Two has just come out, so I've started dabbling with that on the Switch. Um, looking back through my my little list here, I beat a game called Tetraminos, which is like a, a Tetris knockoff. I finally got a platinum trophy for Ridge Race from the Vita after it says seven years and four months on PSN profiles. So that's been a, a long old grind, that one. And on the PS3, I went back and played or finished uh, Datura or Datura and Nobby Nobby Boy and beat both of those. It took so, you nine okay. years to beat Nobby Nobby Boy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was th- I played that. I think that's the first game I bought when I got a PS3. It was it, well, it was um, early. And it was the is the guy who did Katamari Damacy, right? Yeah, and that, that's why I picked it up. And obviously, it's it's not really a it's not a game, really. It's 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 more like an interactive sort of toy box. And I think I'd mm. I'd kind of done half of it, and then only obviously, like I said, in in prep for this, I sort of looked at games I could sort of mop up and finish. So I looked slightly more respectable against your your tallies, Mindy. Um, I like I like that you did prep work. That's so sweet. Yeah, I, <laughs> I feel like, you know, I can't just come on and say that like, I've never seen a game before. I've got a, I've got a <laughs> I tell you what, at nine years, um, at nine yeah, years 12 hours and 37 minutes, you did a lot of research. <laughs> <laughs> it would have taken a while to find that thing. <laughs> I did, yeah. It's been, been a He's long one. Uh, he knew nine years ago <laughs> I'm gonna leave this it. podcast I'm, was going to exist. I'm, I'm going to be on it. Oh, sorry, could I just ask you about and this, Datura? De- uh, yeah, this yeah. is a strange game, isn't it? I tried yeah, this at one point. Yeah, could you just talk it a little is. bit about that? Uh, for those who still have PS3s, I mean, it's it's the type of game. If, if it released now, yeah, if, because it's never come out for anything else. It's still an exclusive. Um, if it had released now, it would mm. certainly be a VR game uh, because it's it's like a first person 
not walking sim, but it's a first person sort of puzzle experience, I suppose. Um, and it, it was desperate to kind of have that sort of, uh, I don't know, like immersive interactive thing. So you could play it with a move controller, even, even back on the PS3. Uh, and a lot of the puzzles involve kind of manipulating the, the controller with the six axis gyroscope thing to sort of pick things up or move around, which doesn't work at all. <laughs> I think the, the controls are terrible. This looks a little familiar. Wasn't this one of the first games they ever gave out on PS Plus? Possibly. Maybe that's why it was on my console. <laughs> I, I honestly don't know. No, I'm, just, I'm just looking at the sheer number of owners of yeah. this game. I mean, it's... I, I enjoyed it for what it was, and I, I think, if nothing else, the visuals actually stand up really well, despite you know being as old as it is now. Mm-hmm. But the, but the core kind of mechanics of it didn't really work for me, uh, and I think the the story was kind of uh, deliberately, I don't know what you'd call it, d- deliberately that you could sort of take away what you want from it. One of those ones, and it wasn't particularly satisfying to beat at the end. But you know, it only it was, it was very it. abstract. Yeah, it, it's kind of very much like open to interpretation that you finish and you look back on your choices and you're meant to think about yourself in in some way. But yeah, I don't know. It, it was nothing special, but it was, like I said, just trying to desperately get a few hundred percents before I spoke to you guys. <laughs> yeah, of course. You definitely did. I'm looking at this list. You you really worked. <laughs> I mean, also, you'll probably see because you're scrolling down. I got a bundle of uh, Japanese visual novels for the Vita off eBay. Off eBay. <laughs> I was going to ask you. I didn't realize you were a native Japanese speaker as well. Uh, no, but there's a lot of good trophy guides out there, aren't there? <laughs> there really is, isn't there? So I see again, you picked the, the quick ones too. Well done. <laughs> yeah, well, they were all sold as a bundle. Some, someone had like a whole mm-hmm. group of them who'd obviously bought them for that reason and then was just selling them on. Uh, and oh, you I, bought I these physical? The okay. <laughs> yeah, I just got yeah. them, did the same thing, and then, then eBayed them on. Um, yeah. So again, I, th- I think I beat six or seven. None of them took more than half an hour, really. No. Um, but again, it's just, you know, trying to trying to boost that level a little bit. I don't, I don't want to be left behind. You know, I'm coming on a, a, a PlayStation trophy podcast. I've got to, got to do my efforts. I, I tell you what, you know you're talking to a trophy hall when you see one and two and three and four of Grisalia. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> that's impressive. Yeah. It's impressive you got those physical too. But anyway, yeah, oh, that's good. Oh, you have got quite a few VNs, don't you? And yeah, yeah, just recently. Look at, look at these abs <laughs> animals as well. Look at this. Wow. But I like I like that your research Fantastic. wasn't just yeah. your research. Sorry, your prep work wasn't just like there's a lot of easy peasy stuff here, but like Ridge Racer takes some time. You've got PlayStation All Stars Battle Royale, which you didn't platinum, but you definitely put some work into it. Yeah, just the other day, I I realized there was quite a lot of achievable stuff that wasn't wasn't difficult, but just would take a little bit of time. Um, so last weekend, I, I had kind of a free day, and I I sort of chipped through a lot of this stuff. And Ridge Racer, like you say, I, I really like the Ridge Racer franchise. I've always really enjoyed it. And the Vita game is a huge disappointment, and more so because that is that's the last canon Ridge Racer release that we've had, and that was years ago now. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just there was wasn't much game to it. Like it, it launched with about three tracks and maybe six cars, uh, and you were expected just to grind this out again and again, just for time trials and, and like hot laps and things like that. And it's why it's kind of I pick it up every six months maybe and play for another hour or two uh, and finally when i when i picked it up this time i thought no i could i could actually beat this i'm like i'm on the home stretch now so i i did that because that's you know out of all this rubbish like i just said all, all these vns ridge racer at least is something that i can kind of say yeah not many people have that i, I did put the work in for that one mm. oh, that is very nice i'm gonna have to ask about accounting plus as well how did you find that yes i i quite enjoyed it i mean i i'm not the biggest uh, rick and morty fan uh, like Accounting Plus is is written and voiced by uh, Justin Roiland in in part, who's one of the co-creators of Rick and Morty. And it's it's not always my favourite thing. Like there's been episodes I've really liked and there's been episodes I've kind of been really hot and cold on. But I think as an experience, Accounting Plus almost feels like um, very similar to the, the Psychonauts VR game, where it's kind of a, a series of just room puzzles that are, are not mm. too dissimilar to like if, if it was point and click style um, in, in that kind of like solving uh, and it's yeah, it's it's quite enjoyable. I, I, th- I think it was you know it's not a difficult playthrough really once you figure out kind of the type of thing it's asking you to do. Um, but the, the trophies certainly they they make you sort of go back and revisit and think about things. So it's it's got some it's it's quite clever. I think it it does a lot with a little if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Is this the game? I think I started this game. Is this the one? It might be the their other one they made. I'm not sure. Where you early on and there's a bird uh, and it's just continually swearing at you. 
just really yes, loudly yeah, over yeah. and over. Yeah, Mindy. So this bird yeah, is just abusing you at the start, and it was too much. I couldn't figure out what to do, and it was consistently abusing me, and it was it was too much. I had to stop. I like I get enough of that in my own life. I don't need a bird doing it in a game. And yeah, I mean, working. Here, here comes here comes a dad joke. Here comes a dad joke. Was it a mockingbird? <laughs> oh, if we only had a symbol noise. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely like you say. It's it's quite abrasive yes. as, as an experience. I think you have to be in the right mood for it. Yeah. Um, and and again, I, I think people who really enjoy, say, like the the writing style of Rick and Morty, will probably get more out of it than I did, because it has a very similar kind of conversational and and really, yeah. you know, like I said, abrasive style to it. Of course, but it does have some good jokes. Yeah. I think there's yeah. some scenes that are quite funny. Uh, so overall, I think I picked it up quite cheap digitally. It was only about. Uh, five or six pounds English money, so so not a huge amount for your yes. dollar conversion, uh, yeah. and yeah, it's it's worth a play, I think. Yeah, which one? We've got two different dollars. Yeah, here. I mean Aussie dollars, aren't they? About like a hundred to the pound. <laughs> he's he's not referring to our dollars. Yeah, no one no one here has seen a pound. You know, that's that's a <laughs> mythical amount. <laughs> Sometimes when they migrate across, they bring some with them to show us what they look like. But. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. I oh, know that. Yeah, yeah. I, I should go back to that game. At some point, definitely. Yeah, that's that's a that look. That's quite a lot. That may be more than Mindy's played this Ooh. week. I think because she's uh she's been focused. I think is that correct, Mindy? I have been after after the last couple of uh, weeks of just frantic frantic playing of a lot of stuff. I've played a grand total of two games this week. Mm. Uh, one of them is Assassin's Creed Odyssey. I actually beat the game. Um, well done about about um maybe an hour and a half before we started recording oh wow okay i i i consider myself having earned the plat because i've left two two trophies off no three that are very easy to do but uh there's a a trophy earning event going on over at uh playstationtrophies.org right now so i'm saving those for specific points in that trophy earning event oh i see and then I've just kind of been chipping away at the the two free DL or the the free DLC pack that's going on, and I'm waiting for a price drop because I think forty dollars for a season pass is ridiculous. Just before you move on, because I know the next one's important. Uh, um, are you going to talk about? Did you, last week we talked a little bit about just how big this game was and, and keeping track of the overall story and stuff because there was so much mm-hmm. other stuff. Now that you've finished the story and I haven't, so please no spoilers. What do you think? Do you think it, it ties back in, or do you think that's still a, a concern for the game? Do you do you mean the overall story as in the story of the series or the story that's being told in the game? No, the in-game story, yeah. The story in the series um, is long gone now. <laughs> it, re- it really is. Like, I used to really enjoy that stuff, and now I'm just like, I, I feel like you're just making this up. Like, in the early days, it felt like they had a plan. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And and I think I think it kind of got derailed when Ezio got super popular, and they're like, oh, we're going to make two more games about this guy. Mm-hmm. But now we have to, you know, drag it out. I've never played an Assassin's Creed game. <laughs> you should. They're fun. Play f- <laughs> where, where would I start at this stage? Obviously, there's about 40 now. What, what is a good jumping on point? Um, I would say... Does it, does it even matter for the story? Is it connected anymore? Not really. And, and most of them will give you a kind of an overview of what's going on in the modern day stuff anyway. Yeah. Um, I would say in terms, I would say two, but it's so, it's so, uh, there's so much stuff that they've put in the series since then that makes it easier to, and, and little, like more fun to play. Yeah. Um, I would say two, if you're really into the story four, just for the pirates, the world, the world is a little bigger. You're a pirate. Like, uh, that one was a lot of fun for me. Um, I enjoyed Syndicate quite a bit. I know that one had mixed, uh, a mixed reception, but that's also kind of maybe maybe Unity was like this too. But that was kind of when they started moving away and expanding the open world more. Yeah. So you still had kind of the city setting, and you could you could parkour around it, but there was a lot of open space. That might have also been three because you were in the woods a lot for that one. Unity, you know, it's still a little buggy. It's gotten a lot better. And I really, I, I talked about like Odyssey, and I still, having played now, having finished 
I'm sorry, Origins. Having finished Odyssey, I preferred Origins over Odyssey, but that's personal preference in terms of which point in history I am more interested in. Are you at all concerned about this trophy stink eye? Recover the Cyclops' eye from a goat? I understand there's a lot of goats on Kefalonia. There are. It's just, it's an RNG trophy. Um, no one li- mm. no one likes those. Isn't that awesome? But you no. just have to go in and no. slaughter a bunch of goats until you find what you're looking for. I, I think, actually, this is a rare instance where it's better than that it's RNG, and it's not that you've got this huge pack of goats and you're looking for, like, one with a very specific birthmark. You know what I mean? Yes, yes. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Where you can just go into a pile of ghosts and just start swinging your sword and just wait for the trophy to pop, basically. <laughs> As most developers, you know, no, that that's just a lot of fun, isn't it? Please keep putting trophies like that in your games. It's just it's just great. Yeah. <laughs> well, they, they kind of do now uh, because Syndicate had one where you're supposed to kill a horse for no reason other than you get a trophy for it. That should be a and trophy it's called, in every well, and it, it's called like what's, it's called like what the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> I like that. And it's just for for killing a horse, yes. like when you're, or killing a couple of horses, hmm. uh, and it's all in cap letters. They're yelling at you. I love that. The only other thing I was going to ask about that is last week we talked about the story creator mode. Did you did you end up using that at all? Like, uh, did you did you try any, or did you turn it on? Or I tried I tried a couple. Um, mm. You know, I talked about how it was possible that that Ubisoft was shooting themselves in the foot with this because mm. people are going to make XP and resource and and uh, money boosting levels, and they do. But uh, unless unless I've missed something, uh, it appears that you can only play these levels once if they're That's community created. Yes, they seem they seem Ooh. to go away mm. Mm. once you uh, once you've played them, which <laughs> I I. You know, I get because they're trying to weed out, you know, dirty cheaters. Cheat. I won't call it cheating. I will call them ex. You know, exploitation. Boosting. Boosting. Boosting is a much better term. Mm. But what about yeah. these people who make fun themed levels? Like, like um, I saw one that was like a Lord of the Rings level. Yes. And CJ, you said you you tried something that was like a oh, yeah, Star Wars. Yeah. Yeah. Star Wars level. <laughs> yes, yeah, it was... Like, what if you want to play that more than once? You can't, right? I don't like, think you can't, so. No, you can't save it and say, "I want to play this again." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I actually got. I played a little last night, and I got trolled in a single player game, which is fantastic. And it wasn't myself trolling me either, which is unusual. So I jumped into one, and I, they say, "Don't they mean the degree of difficulty?" Like it says, if it's sort of an easy or a medium or, or a difficult one. So I always go for the easy ones with a short time limit because it says how long it roughly takes as mm-hmm. well. And so this one said nine minutes, which is really pushing it for me. But I thought I'll give it a go because it did say easy. Anyway, so it took forever to get there on the automatic horse, and then it was like in this like cabin type thing so i went in there and i was like oh i don't know what's supposed to happen and then out of nowhere 40 heavily armored guys at level 50 came out and just proceeded to just massacre me uh so over (laughs) and it took it took it took ages to get there and i died within like three seconds so you know that was that was a fantastic joke on whoever made that one thank you for that uh you know (laughs) it definitely was not easy but i think i think there's a wide mix isn't there because i have played a lot that are unfortunately not in english either so I, i don't know what the story is it could be could be good. I don't, I don't know. know. I will say when you asked about the scope of it, there's a. I, I don't know if it's a game design thing or I just didn't pay attention to something or what, but there is a lot of stuff in this game that, you know, I talked about how a lot of stuff that I did with side quests, there's a lot of stuff in this game that looks like it's something you need to do to progress the game, and you really don't. Like, um, you'll get, you know, mission icons or whatever. And they used to differentiate between, they used to have an icon difference between this is a mission you need to progress the story and this is a side mission that you don't. They don't have that anymore. All Mm. of them are the same Mm. icon. And also, uh, what was the other big one? Oh, you can do kind of ground battles, you know, Athens versus um, Sparta. And in previous games, we do things like this. Like, you had to conquer the territories, whether it was for story reasons or for trophy reasons. And usually that trophy is, like, conquer all the regions. You don't have to do either of those things Mm. to progress the story. And I wasted a lot of time 
get, uh, getting, I mean, it, it, ultimately it wasn't a total waste because it leveled me up, but all the major important stuff levels up with you. So regions will, will kind of level cap at your standard enemies, but bosses and stuff like that will all level up when you do. So there's no like real god mode you can play in this. I wasted a lot of time going around and conquering, you know, enemy forts and guard posts and things like that to mm-hmm. to weaken territories enough that I could conquer them for one side or the other. And with the plan of just going through and conquering, you know, all at once. And I found I, I figured out you, you don't have to do that for anything in this game. You don't have, at no point are you picking a side and saying, I'm going to fight for Sparta. I'm going to fight for Athens. The more you leave, except for a few regions, the more you, the the longer you leave it, it just keeps, it it refortifies itself. So it's not like, you you know, you've conquered a fort and that's done and that whatever percentage of that area's power is diminished. Over time, that percentage will go back up and you'll have to go and do it again if you want to conquer that region. So, you know, a little time-saving tips for people who are thinking of playing this game or playing this game. Obviously, do it if you have fun with it. I'm not stopping you from doing that. I'm just saying it is is not something you need to do, but it is presented in the game like it is one of your main goals to accomplish in this game, is to conquer the the map. And it's really, really not. Yeah, it's, it is a very dynamic map. I mean, this is, it's moving. Yeah. It's moving so close now to an M, a single, we talked about this last week, but like a single player MMO, if, if a thing would ever exist, where you, you can just get lost in, in, in you know, just just busy work, I suppose, side quests and, you know, whatever. But yeah, interesting. And then uh, please, Irony Curtain. So Irony Curtain, uh, Artifacts Money did get back to me. I did get a, a, co- a code for, art- for, <laughs> for Irony Curtain and I posted my guide up last night i got a little sidetracked by assassin's creed so it took a couple of days um yeah i liked this one i did what is it It, it's so it's (laughs) what type of game is it chris you might you might like it too it's so (laughs) all right so 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 chris and i have this kind of in joke where he mentions hidden object adventure games just to piss me off (laughs) (laughs) is this a hidden object game (laughs) no it's not that's the interesting thing is that the company that developed okay. this that's all they make yeah. is hidden object adventure games and uh, the closest did they, did they hook you up with a code they, because you are such a, a, a fan they called me an influencer no it's because all i do is write walkthroughs <laughs> for their games um <laughs> they called me an influencer and i think that's funny but um they uh, the closest they ever got to developing a non-hidden object adventure game was My Brother Rabbit. And so what that was was just making the entire game the hidden object game instead of just certain puzzles. Yeah. Um, and it was a cute little game. You know, I like uh, My Brother Rabbit was. It was a cute little game. But I was like, that's. I feel like that's it. If they're going to make a non-traditional hidden object adventure game, like that's what they're going to make. So then they announced that Iron, like, probably six months ago, maybe, Irony Curtain came out. And this is a proper point, like I what I would call a point-and-click game. Yeah, like a classic adventure style point-and-click. Like and a click. classic, like, not not like with the with the verb bank. Uh, it's it's much more in the vein of, of things like Deponia. It shows a love for and has, has many references to classic adventure games specifically monkey island there's a lot of monkey island references in this game more than more than i had expected actually but it's it's a satire it's a cold war satire game and it's about this guy who who is just who has this starry-eyed who is starry-eyed and enamored with with uh communism you know one of those people who sees only and this is not a politics discussion (laughs) it's really not I saw some some person on like Steam or something was like, I'm tired of these Trump bashing games. And I'm like, ooh, that's that's your issue. At no yeah. point is there reference <laughs> to to the Trump administration in this game. Like if you're seeing that, that's your issue you need to look into. But he is. He's one of those kind of star eyed guys who only sees the good stuff and the 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 good parts of the ideology and not the reality or the the you know the bad parts of it. So he 
is trying to spread the word of, of Matryoshka, which is this communist country. And uh, he he goes there and, and basically stumbles into spy intrigue and just becomes this unwilling, bumbling agent to help with, you know, conspiracies in the in the regime. I liked it. It was it was fun. When when you write guides, I know you've been doing this for years and I've, I've never asked you, are you making notes as you play through the game? in order to as i play through as i play because through, yeah. you still beat these games quite quickly well that's because i have alternate accounts that take much much longer ah, for me to beat these games on i see <laughs> my uh my main account my main account is my i have written my walkthrough and i am testing it to make sure it works okay and getting a <laughs> getting a time on how long this that game makes more take. sense because when, when i've looked like say i saw that you'd beaten this game and it said it took you what two three hours or something. It took me it took me two hours and eleven minutes, and that makes me really angry because it was it was far from a flawless run. I could have gotten probably one one thirty, yeah, probably because because I saw that and then I saw that you'd written this walkthrough, and I, I was thinking, how is this even possible? How how can you completely <laughs> chart a game and beat it in in you know just over two hours? But. It makes sense oh. now if you do the oh, if you gosh, do the work. No, prior. no. If, if you look at my alternate accounts, you'll see, <laughs> um, you'll see like a, a, a an artifacts. Generally, artifacts money games will take me, mm, by depending on the length of the game, and the difficulty of the puzzles between five and seven hours to beat. Yeah, and that's of course also taking time to write out walkthrough stuff. And then when I turn around and replay it just testing the walkthrough it it boils down to about two hours yeah. that's very honest of you mindy chris she could have just said you know why does it take you so long <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, why, why are you so rubbish <laughs> that's right <laughs> because chris has chris has like a life <laughs> and i don't yeah yeah oh well, we'll look at it would you would you I, are you you know what i'm gonna ask mindy is it worth playing or not yeah i think it is i think it's a lot of fun i did play this there is a patch out for it now. Um, I don't know if if the patch addressed a couple of the issues I had with this game. The controls can get a little out of alignment sometimes, specifically hotspot registering. So you'll think you're... Um, sorry, my throat's really scratchy. Uh, you'll think that you're interacting with one thing, but really it's it's highlighting another hotspot that doesn't look like it's been selected, but it has. That's not, it's not very common that it happens, but it, it does happen when there's just an, when you're in an awkward mm -hmm. position on screen. And then, um, oh, some of the cutscenes have really, really bad lag. And it seems like it's a loading issue. I don't know. Oh, and the third one, sorry, the third one is if you leave the game running, and it's not paused and you're not doing something like if you're just standing there, the game will crash after a couple minutes. I have no idea why it like if, if you're just playing the game, that's fine. If you've put it on pause, that's fine. It's when you're just standing there in the game doing nothing that it'll crash after a few minutes. Oh, so it might be worth waiting for a little while on that one then. Perhaps. Well, no, because there is a patch now. I just don't know what the patch does. Oh, OK. Sorry. It's been patched since then. Yeah. Okay. Oh, listeners, you can try it out. I'm sure many of you will coming in at <laughs> that one and a half hours. Okay, fair enough. And that's it. That's all I played this week. Sorry, that's all you've played. Good. Okay, well, I'll just do a really quick whip around listeners uh, of what I've been playing. I spoke really briefly last week about this game, Riverbond by Coco Cucumber Studios. This is like a little voxel. It's a top-down, I suppose like a little dungeon crawler. Uh, there are eight characters, eight stories. It's really cute writing. It's very easy game. It, it, it is a uh, drop-in, drop-out couch co-op as well, but no online co-op for this one, uh, although you can easily, easily play it by yourself. And it's just, it's really fun time. Like, I don't like Minecraft. I can't handle that at all. But 
Yeah, I can tell because you got the platinum yes. and it took you more than two hours to mm. do it. Well, I, <laughs> the game is probably only four to five hours long. I just did it over a couple of weeks. So well, the cool thing about it is once you start a run with the character, you can't save. You have to finish that character's story. But the story takes anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes. So they're only only very short. I mean, you know, uh, short sort of, uh, you know, uh, character arcs, if you like, or whatever else. So it's it's fun. It's really good fun. And there's, I mean, there is a really weird difficulty spike in this. Uh, the second and third last character choices, not the last one. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure what's going on there. But one of the cool things is if you do die, uh, each of the maps. So there's usually about five to eight maps in each each character story, and uh, each map, you know, they're only very small. It would take you a couple of minutes if you explored the whole little little map. Uh, but if you die at any point in the map, you just get reset back to the start of the map or or a checkpoint if you if you unlock one. And the the enemies you killed stay dead or or injured. So it, it gets progressively easier as you go. I suppose. Uh, it is it's really fun would i would i be right in saying this is <clears throat> that this is like if 3d dot game heroes had co-op uh yes yeah yeah that was I, a good game it, it, you would be right yeah, but i think that was quite a difficult game too wasn't it this this is not yeah. yeah it had it had a it had a pretty pretty nasty spike halfway through yeah no this is nothing like that you know this and look this would be great as a as a couch co-op game as well for for a bit of fun the writing is look the writing is whatever i never understand with these games like i understand they need to put a story in some of them are better than others some of them are just filler uh writing but the gameplay itself is fun so i would i would definitely recommend that it is not a cheap game though for what it is so perhaps wait for some sort of deep sale on that one and then what else can i throw oh samurai showdown by athlon games so this came out last Last week, uh, it's a, a fighting game, obviously, but it's a it's a methodical, strategic fight, fighting game. If you like the the the, the combos are, are pretty easy compared to things like you know your Mortal Combat or whatever, and it's it's very. It's very slow, like the, the, the strikes do an incredible amount of damage. So if you end up in the wrong position or the wrong counter, you're gonna you're gonna go down very quickly. But on the on the same time, you don't need to necessarily button mash you know, like some of the other other fighting games. It has a story, but like a like all these Japanese fighters uh, with 16 characters, the story is basically exactly the same with uh, a couple of VN uh, splash screens at the end for difference. But look, I would recommend it. It's good. And there's definitely a skill a skill arc in this game if you wanted to, to persist with it. It has all the usual online features. It has some fun features as well. Like you can you, you get a collection of ghosts from the people you play online and then it puts them into a mode where you can just play them all one after the other uh, and they play the same way. So it's a good way for practicing uh, or improving. Uh, as you go, so I would I would recommend that one. That is a full price game, and then maybe the only other thing I would throw out is Wizards Tawny um, by this developer. They have an awesome name: A Bonfire of Souls. Oh, like so romantic, yeah, it's awesome, isn't it? Yeah. Mm, it is, yeah. A Spanish studio, and this is another um, a co-op game, a uh, local co-op only. Although you you can uh, you can play it by yourself if you wish, and it's sort of like a party game if you like. It's made up of uh, five or six different sort of um, you know games, like little fetchy type quest games, or survive on a platform as the bits break off. Uh, these type of things. So it's really it's quite fun, and you know it, it's just a couple of dollars or whatever as well. It's very well. I mean, you know, minimalistic art style, but it's. Very very well put together you can do single events so they can group them all into a, a tournament if you like and again it's not it's not overly difficult if you're going for the trophies in that you you would need four controllers uh in fact actually if you had four people or four controllers i think the trophies would be incredibly easy because you could just afk four controllers or four accounts because remember on on things like black and white bushido you only really needed two controllers and then you put two accounts on each yeah well controller. i mean you, you could do this game with one controller because you can have uh three you've got to have four people in a match so there can be three ai bots in the match with you but i think if, if you were just farming mm -hmm. sort of like the trophies if you had four people or if you just had th uh, four controllers and you just left the other three uh dead you know not moving it, it would make it very easy to win or whatever as a cleanup so i don't know i see a a couple of people have platted it. I think it's probably, if you were to do that, maybe six or seven hours. Yeah. I think it's just a matter of the, the tournament. But again, you know, you could potentially AFK that if you <laughs> if you just wanted the trophies after you've after you've had enough of playing it. But for you know, for what it is, it, it's a it's a fun five minutes, uh, definitely, I think. So I don't know. Oh, and then did I I don't know if I talked about Monster Jam last week uh, <laughs> at THQ, the people that are buying everything. <laughs> uh, I think listening to the episode i think you mentioned it was coming out but i don't know if you'd yeah it yet. yeah look it's good it you know look i this this thq i don't know like that dark side is three i thought 
I mean, they're, they're definitely like a, what's the word, like double A, A studio. Yeah. I don't know. They're somewhere in the middle. And I thought that was a little, because again, they're charging full price for a lot of their games. That was a little disappointing for what it was. This is this is like a three quarter price game, which I think is fairer. It's not in the traditional Monster Jam style of the of the three D side scrolling races. It's just like a, a, a normal racer, if you like. There's, I mean, there's sort of three to four events that that cycle through, but there, there's definitely a difficulty spike in the game. You have to do a career mode, and probably my pet hate in this game is that. There are 16 competitors in an event and the, the points run from 16 down to one. So first and second, you know, 16, 15, 14. The problem is, is there's one style of event that has multiple sections to it, which is actually really tough. So if you don't do well in that, even though you're winning everything else, you can get absolutely hammered because you can't build up any sort of a points um, differential against the competitors. And of course, the AI, the top three, always finish in the top three. So that can be a little bit frustrating. Uh, but, you know, aside from that, it's quite... It's quite fun. And then, of course, for some reason, it has collectibles in a racing game, which <laughs> why not? It's great. <laughs> oh, look, it's lovely, isn't it, in the open world? So, but look, it, you know, again, again, I'd probably wait on, on a sale on that one. It is way better than the one that came out, uh, the first one they put out for PS4 uh, a couple of years ago. But, you know, it, it's still it's still somewhere, uh, somewhere in the middle there, I suppose. And yeah, because no one else has mentioned it. I'm going to ask Chris. You, you're not a Final Fantasy 14 player, are you, by any chance? I'm not. No, I've I've heard you're a big fan, but um, no, I, I have never played. Yeah, look, look, you should. You should. <laughs> <laughs> there, there goes a thousand hours. Look, I'm a massive fan, but you know, I don't know. I'm not. I think I'm stuck on Assassins or something. I'm not fully in 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 there at the moment. Other than to say that the expansion is fantastic. It, it feels like a modern. I mean, the, the graphics, they've been up you know, which is, is no small feat in an MMO, uh, I think. And, and the color the color palettes, they've gone with a lot of purple, which I know is the color of the, color of the year, Far Cry, and whatever else. But it's it's nice to play. They've, the music, they've got a bit of electric guitar, a bit of rock hidden in, thrown in there, which is, you know, unusual compared to the rest of the game soundtrack. But it's it's really good. And from from the people that have been playing it, they, they tell me that it, it's fantastic. The leveling is not too bad uh, if you're already at level 70, to, to move through the story and there's a ton of content so i might save that till i've played played some more i think yeah yeah that's a lot yeah. and unfortunately i did not turn on the switch or the xbox again this week so look you know fantastic paperweights there but let's 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 one one day one day chris <laughs> let's uh let's uh, <laughs> let's uh let's move on to some new releases this is gonna be a long one i can tell <laughs> this episode <laughs> Yeah, well, we'll we'll rein it in. We'll rein it in. <laughs> what have we got this week? Who wants to start? Chris, why don't you start? Okie dokie. Looking at releases this week, I pulled out and had a look at uh, As Divine Dios, uh, which I assume is a sequel to the other As Divine RPG games that that Chemco have made. Uh, the main reason I pulled it aside is is because I love that certain publishers are still supporting the Vita. Uh, and and this kind of cross buy stuff, which was fantastic when it was you know started with the PS3 and Vita and then moved through to the PS4 as well. Uh, I, I still think it was a really nice initiative. That the, the Vita is one of my favourite machines, uh, and it's it's been fantastic that there's these few companies still. Uh, obviously, with the I think I think you're going to like a guest we're going to have on in the near future. <laughs> I, I can guess who that is. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I think it's brilliant. It's it's a handheld that was really served poorly by Sony. And and I think it's been nice in in its kind of twilight years, which is obviously kind of in now. There are still these these diehard developers that are thinking, well, if it if it runs on it, we might as well put it out. And I mean, it can't sell that well uh, for this kind of. It's it's a really the other as divine games are really vanilla top down RPGs, uh, and I imagine this is similar. But it's it's just makes me really happy that the Vita is still listed on the on the PlayStation blog as as being a console that exists. Mm, so so it's it. it's always nice to see. Yeah, long live it. <laughs> Perfect. Mindy, have you got one for us? I do. I have one because we're trying to move this along. I know, Chris, you have another one you want to talk about, and I want you to talk about <laughs> But I am going to steal Stranger Things 3, the game. Very nice. Stranger Things 3, the game, is the official companion game to Season 3 of the hit original series. This adventure game, yay! blends a distinctly retro art style with modern gameplay mechanics to deliver nostalgic fun with a fresh new twist. Explore, solve puzzles, and battle the emerging evils of the Upside Down. All right, so at time of recording, 
Uh, Stranger Things comes out this weekend. It's tomorrow, isn't it? Doesn't it launch? Is tomorrow? it tomorrow? Fourth is it? July. Is it strictly? I thought it was Fourth of July weekend. Is uh, it? I, th- is I it thought it was all, all done period? to the yeah, I think so for Independence, isn't it? Yeah, maybe. Oh, that's right. We've got a conflict here because uh, you know the colonies are going to get rowdy tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, stra- so season three is is coming out. So we're going to get tie-in game. We don't get you know. We are all of an age that we remember tie-in games. Yeah. Like everything had a tie-in Absolutely. game. Absolutely. That's not that's not really a thing anymore. At least not on console. No, it's, it's you tend to see them more on yeah. on on mobile. What I what I find fun about this, well, a if if you remember before they went belly up, uh, Telltale was supposed to make a Stranger Things game. They were. They announced that they had gotten the license. I think two months before they they uh, they folded. Um, but, and, and I'm a little curious about this is a f- way back in season one of stranger things, a fan went on to, uh, itch itchio or itch.io, however you say it. And he put out, uh, like a two screen, just fan made demo of what, of his interpretation of stranger things as a classic early nineties point and click with the verb, with the verb bank and the. And it wasn't intended to be a full game. It was just, you know, I just had a little fun with it. Here's, you know, my tribute, my my creation, whatever. And, you know, this got enough views and enough compliments that it was covered by some, some um, gaming news outlets and everyone wanted him to make it a full game. And nothing was really ever reported after that. And I'm kind of wondering if this is, if, if, if the, uh, the series... Uh, owners, if the owners of Stranger Things got in touch with this guy and said, let's actually do something. Because granted, I'm just looking at the logo alone, but it very much looks like that kind of early 90s point and click uh, aesthetic. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what it's actually like, the game. I, I remember it was um, announced in a Nintendo stream a few months back on one of their kind of like indie highlight reels. Um, but, I, but I can't actually recall what it looked like. Was it? I think it flashed by just as a quick like, oh, something else is coming to the Switch. But yeah, I, I don't really remember what it was like as in terms of like what the actual genre is within the adventure wrapper. This might this might be a day one for me. I don't really say that anymore. But mm. This might be a day one for Fair me. Fair enough. <laughs> it's not not a day one for me. I can assure you. <laughs> <laughs> I will report back. We'll hear about that. Yeah. Now, Chris, would you like to throw out another one for us? Yeah, I mean, this other one, looking through the list, it's a game called Ovivo, or Ovivo, uh, which it says is a digital PS4 only this time. Um, But the description says, Ovivo is a mesmerizing platform with unusual mechanics where everything is as simple as black and white. It is a metaphorical game filled with illusions and hidden messages. In the world of Ovivo, black and white exist in harmony. By constantly intertwining and replacing each other, they maintain balance. So it's a very oblique description. But the thing that drew me to it was it's got quite a stark art style in this little logo they've, they've kind of presented with it. And looking at the background, there is a small shape which looks like one of the characters from Loco Roco, yes. <laughs> which I, I don't know if that's on purpose. And also, actually, the characters at the bottom look a bit like uh, Patapon. Yeah. An- another weird uh, PSP franchise. So oh, maybe yeah. there is a, I don't know who the development team is behind this, but I think there there might be something to it. I'm wondering if this if this plays a lot like Shift. Uh, it could do. It's got that color scheme, doesn't it? Because yeah. Shift had kind of the same thing, where it was it was black and white, and you would rotate the stage. So at one point, you could only interact with things that were like you were black, and you could only interact with stuff that was black. Yeah. Otherwise, it was treated as empty space. Or if you rotated the the stage, you were in white, and you could only interact with things or white, and all the black was open space. And I kind of wonder if this is the same the same deal. It's actually a, a platformer. You play as a as a circle, a white circle, and you you um the black is the sort of the the base, if you like, and you sort of jump over the things and it's very new agey and uh, and collect the dots to fill out a story, uh, a non narrative, uh, a non um written story, if you like. Yeah. It's 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 good. I would recommend it as well. It's not particularly long, a couple of hours, um, and some lovely mm. music as well. So yeah, it's a very chilled game. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah, perfect. Does anyone else uh, have anything else they want to throw out? I don't. Have you got? You haven't done anything, have you? 
Yeah, look, I'm, I'm going to throw out one as well. Now, I'm really looking forward to this game, uh, Sea of Solitude. Uh, so this is an EA uh, published game, the Joe jo Mir uh, game. So this is part of that thing they did a while ago where they, they basically help, like, smaller pu- uh, developers or whatever, and they publish them and, and they don't take, you know, money or they don't take much of a cut for themselves. So, you know, like, it's, it's a good story. And this game, uh, I'll just read here. So when humans get too lonely, uh, they turn into monsters. Set sail across across a beautiful and evolving world of darkness and light and discover what it means to be human. Embark on a nuanced and intimate action adventure where players must guide Kay through her sea of solitude in this touching tale of darkness and light. So this is a game about depression, uh, about loneliness, and, and basically how you deal with it. It's a really really unique take. You're, a, you're in a sort of a, a semi-open world, uh, although apparently slightly linear uh, path, uh, through the open world for the the story and stuff and it's sort of if you become too lonely uh or or, you know too depressed within the game you turn into a monster so so and you sort of always have this this presence that's you know sort of following you or whatever else to to depict that so it look i would recommend looking at a trailer for this game it's very reasonably priced i think for what it is uh it comes out uh tomorrow friday uh, as of time of this recording and i think it's going to be great the 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 cover song for this is just fantastic as well but then I love this sort of, you know, um, grading acoustic uh, unaccompanied uh, style for these type of things. So I think that's going to be one to, I mean, it will either be fantastic or it'll be dreadful, like like all these games, I suppose. But uh, from what I've seen of it, and I have done a bit of watching and reading, I think it's going to be good. And I will definitely pick that up so we can we can let you know next week yeah so look there is plenty there just a reminder too the playstation plus games come out this week and what have we got detroit uh and heavy rain and yeah it was it was uh what pro evolution soccer yes. yeah yeah for a couple of days and now it's it's yeah. detroit because <laughs> pe- people <That's> win right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh horizon chase turbo which is actually quite a fun uh, a fun sort of uh, retro arcade um racing racing game or which i think might have been on the mobile mobile port i'm not sure on that but anyway that's you know it's free so why not you can have a look and, and make your own decisions on that so with that in mind why don't we why don't we shuffle across to the news and why don't we just go with the roberto williams one today and we might dump out the other one i think is that okay mindy can you live with that sure so so this this makes me happy so um roberto williams is uh the founder of sierra interactive sierra studios uh, they did, of course, King's Quest and Space Quest and Quest for Glory. If it had Quest in it in the 80s, Sierra. And she really was just kind of a pioneer of 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 what has become modern gaming. You know, she <clears throat> played text adventure games in the very early 80s. And she said, but what if also graphics? So that's what she did. She started making text adventure games with graphics and... and um, you know, at the time, games with graphics didn't, you know, unless you were playing a JRPG, we're just going to talk Western gaming here. Games with stories did not have graphics. So she said, no, I want to combine the two. And she really was into um, uh, whatever the new kind of the, the new big thing is. She wanted to try it. So, you know, when CD-ROMs came in, she said, I want to put I want to put a King's Quest game out on CD-ROM when it was not common for people to have CD-ROMs. And I would not call King's Quest V, which is what that one was, a, a, a killer app. <laughs> you know, the one that you you had to buy the CD-ROM to get it because if you played it, you know how awful the voice acting is on that because they were all Sierra employees and not actual voice actors. Like when FMV games were first becoming a thing, uh, she said, no, I want to make an FMV game. That was Gabriel Knight 2, which is a very good game. But she's ma- she made an FMV game with an actual budget, like a, like a, a high budget fmb game instead of just kind of filming something and putting it out and hoping to turn a you know turn a profit and i just i i adore her and i i think it's kind of tragic that in a that outside of a of a specific genre of gamers of of adventure gamers people don't know who she is people do not know the name roberta williams and I feel like if you are a a gamer, no matter what genre in, you're in, you're going to know names like uh, Shigeru Miyamoto. You're going to know names like John Romero. You know, even if you don't play these types of games, you're going to know these names. And I feel like Roberta Williams needs to be on that list for people. 
I really, really do. She's not in the industry anymore. She kind of, she retired in the, um, I want to say the late 90s. And she's just traveling the world doing her thing. Anyway, so the actual news <laughs> is that. <laughs> that was a good history that's lesson. My, that's my little, that was good. That's my little soapbox moment. Well, and I, I want to say why this is, why this is news. Because I, you know, I'm sure there are people, hopefully none of our listeners, but I'm sure there are people who are going to claim you know sexism or token what what the hell ever and i don't think it is i i really do think this is kind of in, in celebration of her legacy anyway so the coalition which did uh gears of war and blackbird interactive which did homeworld remastered have uh, partnered up with the vancouver film school and they've created a two hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollar scholarship and internship program in roberta williams's name and it is a scholarship for women. They say female identifying voices. And it's in mostly in grants of about two to, I think, $25,000. It's not like, you know, one person gets $250,000 to, you know, do whatever. That'd be amazing, though. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's, it's to recognize that at, you know, at the time Roberta Williams was active, there really weren't women in in game development and today there there really aren't a lot of, it's gotten better it certainly has gotten better but there still really aren't that many women in gaming and i, I think this is a great way to kind of encourage to in, encourage women to see you know let's let's see what we can do i'm not i'm not soapboxing and say oh men shouldn't make video games i'm not saying anything like that i'm just saying i like the, i like this bit of news i think it's a, i think it's encouraging I, th I think this stuff is really important. Yeah, I, I think it's really important, especially as games become mm -hmm. more narrative, which has been kind of the, the, the push for years, I suppose, in terms of, you know, from her legacy, as games have become graphic things, narrative has always tied hand in hand with visuals. And I think it's important to have a diversity of voices writing games because it's, it's always about perspective and representation. And, and I think the more people who are involved from different walks of life, from you know, just a whole varied collection of people, it will only ever benefit the stuff we play in, in terms of making just, you know, experiences that you wouldn't have otherwise. Uh, and I think it's, you know, a good initiative if it supports people that maybe thought they, they wouldn't get involved in something like this to actually come forward and say, well, you know, this, this could help me actually, you know, enter the industry in some way. I think it's mm. a good thing. I'll, I'll be interested to see what, what comes out of it. And it's mostly, it's not, it's not a grant like here's, Here's some money, um, at least from my understanding. It's not a grant like here's some, not like you get, like if you if you, if you you went out for funds on Kickstarter and said, I want to make this game, I just need the money to do it. As far as I can tell, it's not that. It's literally more of a scholarship thing. Like you would go specifically to the Vancouver Film School to their um, their game design program. And actually, it, it, it pays for your degree. It's a scholarship. Yeah, I, th I think this sort of stuff's really important. I know it's starting to happen. I mean, it's even happening here in Australia. Screen Screen Australia are starting to fund some of the the indie de uh, devs here that are making games. I mean, it started with Submerged a few years ago, and it's it's increasing. And I think it's really important because uh, in our country here, there is no funding from the government for this type of stuff. So so that there are you know independent or third third body arts organisations, and I think it also it. it it, it, it's mm. leading to a more justification of games as a medium as well as an artistic medium i mean this is not this sort of things are not unusual in music or you know or, or, or photography or art these sort of things so it is great to see that, that something yeah. like this is happening and then also i noticed which i thought was lo was lovely is that it will it will in, it will uh, guarantee a work placement afterwards and a, a game credit which is you know so important so you can prove that you have experience as well in the industry so that's great well especially because lately because uh, as as this um, as the article uh, talking about the scholarship rightly points out, uh, X Seed was in quite a bit of hot water uh, when it came out that their their um, their company policy is if you are not currently employed with this company when the game goes to retail printing, your name is not in the credits. Yeah, I saw that actually recently. Like if you if you translated an entire game and then were fired or quit or died, mm. you know. Before the game got published, your name was just taken out of the game. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's ridiculous. And it seems like it, I can't imagine that's legal. <laughs> it's certainly immoral. Yeah, yeah. 
but I, I actually wonder if it is actually illegal. Yeah, I think there's big shakeups. You know, it's coming. it's one thing to get a get a you know a, a what is it, Alan Smithy credit, or to request that your name be removed. I don't know, man. Mm, I don't know. I don't know either. Well, let's let's segue across to the topic this week. We 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 were always going to get there eventually. It was just a question of when. I don't know how's Chris going. This would have been like five episodes for him now. Is he still with us? I'm still here. I'm still here. We're, we're hitting. Uh, we're getting close to as long as my when I was guest. Yeah, I know. I my know. I know, I know. Well, let's let's shuffle in. So we're going to talk collecting, modern collections, and collecting today. Do you want to do you want to start us off, Mindy, with some some questions for Chris or get the ball rolling? Yeah, so I, Chris and I kind of bonded years and years ago over retro collecting, but my understanding, Chris, is that you've kind of focused more on modern collecting, which I think is not as common as people who who yeah. collect retro games. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's it's interesting, like doing the, the podcast that I do, like, like CJ's mentioned, it's a lot of kind of primarily retro stuff, like older games um, in terms of like my favorite games I've ever played. And I think what I find interesting about games is is because of our age, like all of us are kind of, you know, similar enough in age that we've essentially lived through all of gaming's mainstream popularity from kind of almost year dot. And and what I really like about that is that, you know, I love music, I love films, all these different mediums that I, I enjoy. It's impossible to have like a wide working knowledge of that stuff because it, it you know, it was around before I was essentially. Whereas with games, I've almost been part of it through its whole genesis up until now. And uh, I, I did for a while, I used to collect kind of older games. I used to have a collection of kind of, you know, my, my favorite, say like Mega Drive stuff or, or Genesis for, for overseas players or like Super Nintendo stuff or, or Game Boy stuff or any of this stuff on cartridges. But as, as time goes on, I, I sort of phased that collection out because it became easier to kind of get hold of those games in, in other ways. Whereas sort of modern collecting and the, and the stuff that we're, we're around now because it's been a real push for for kind of digital distribution, certainly in the last decade, say, I really got into the idea of wanting to preserve what was here because the digital stuff may not always exist. We ju- we just so did I, an episode I, on that. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, and I th- I think that's really important though to to think about this idea that as as much as we try to legitimise this stuff and say games are important and games as a medium is something that's you know a big deal that there's millions and millions of dollars is part of this industry. I, I think people don't always realize that it only takes a flick of a switch on, on the other end and a game's not available. Something you downloaded because a licensing has changed, a, a patch will come out that removes some of the content or some of the music that was involved or whatever. And, and a big part of wanting to collect kind of more current stuff, so I'm talking kind of like the PlayStation 2 era onwards, is that this is the stuff that will, I think will get harder and harder to get hold of because it, they're bigger files. They're not as easy to back up like for for kind of, you know, uh, naughty sort of ROMs and emulation and stuff like that. And I, I just like having this kind of library so I, I can kind of see where games have come from, where we're at now and, and where we're going forwards. It's sort of the idea of just having a working knowledge of as much stuff as possible. Mm-hmm. Now, one, uh, one question I have is that one of the reasons I got out of uh, retro collecting was because of the rise of things like emulation, which is which is great. You know, I, I think preserve things... Mm. However you can, if that means digitally, then so be it. The problem, of course, was yeah. uh, then you got this cottage industry of um, repro cartridges. And generally, yeah, I, I would say most people who made re- repro cartridges were doing it in good faith. They were either taking translated ROMs of games yeah. that had not come out in the West, but had for years had a translated ROM just kind of floating around on the internet, and put them on a cartridge so you could play them on your system. Or you would have people who would take the like the really high value any and generally they're NES games like uh Snow Brothers, things like yeah. that, but they would make it very very obvious that you were buying a reproduction cartridge game. The 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 um casing would be a weird color the label would would look weird or it would be the actual label but it would have reproduction written on it and that's all acting in good faith but more and more you see these people who who make it and try to pass it off as the real thing and scam people so for yeah oh probably 30 bucks worth of uh electronics you could sell it as a legitimate uh you know two three hundred dollar nes cartridge 
is that and granted i'm asking this because i have not really kept up with it that's not that's not really is that possible to do yeah. uh or do easily with disc based games not particularly i mean earlier consoles uh stuff like say the the sega cd um or I, I think the like whatever the CD add-on for the PC Engine was, or the Turbo Graphics stuff like that. I don't think they had any copy protection essentially. And the only thing that I like, I do. I've got an old Sega Saturn that I have now that I've modified so it doesn't have a disc drive anymore. It just has an SD card reader essentially. So with with stuff like that, like I had quite a big Saturn collection, but you know, sold it on to finance other stuff at some stage. But there are ways of, of with stuff that's kind of old enough before copy protection was as kind of solid as it is now that you, you can still get kind of disc images and play things that way. So no one is really selling reproduction stuff like that because the CD drives themselves generally uh, still struggle with kind of copied media, but yeah, certainly not like, like NES cartridges. I don't think there's a big, you know, industry for that kind of bootleg Saturn or PlayStation games or anything like that. Mm. Now, um, and what I really want to focus on, what I think is is more, I shouldn't say more interesting, because I, th- I think it's interesting, and I think a lot of people will find it interesting, but more, uh, let's say, modern day relevant, yeah. is talking about cottage industries. We now have uh, a lot, surprisingly a lot, of competing uh, companies that are, are making physical copies of games that have only been digital. We do. Like when I was, <laughs> there when are I was, a lot. <laughs> There are a lot. And and one of the reasons I asked you on is because I know that you've dealt with almost, if not all. I, I think I probably companies. have. I, I think I probably have. You know, when I was when I was still really in it, there were three. There was there was uh, limited run, there was uh Play Asia or East Asia Soft, whatever you want to call them. Yeah. And then like the new kid in town, uh, when I was starting to get out of it, but had ordered from them was signature edition games. Yeah. And a those UK were the three. Yeah, yeah. And now there are how many? Well, I mean, I made a little list earlier. I'm probably missing some because there are there's a few recent ones that are still unproven in, in that they haven't shipped their first releases yet. Uh, but certainly the ones that I know of that I have copies on shelves are, like you mentioned, like Signature Edition, uh, Limited Run, uh, Play Asia, but also some of the ones that have been running for quite a while now. We have Strictly Limited Games, which runs out of Germany uh, and have, have published a good 15, 20 games now across Vita, PS4 and Switch. Uh, we have special reserve games in America that op- often deals with Devolver Digital stuff. Uh, so they've put out things like Enter the Gungeon and things like that on the PS4. We have Red Art Games, a, a French company that, again, really supported the Vita up until the point that obviously Vita production now for cartridges is, is done in America and, and Europe. Um, so up up to a point, they, they put out six, seven Vita games as well as some PS4 stuff. And now we're starting to transition into Switch as well. Uh, and also, I, I think they're an Australian company called Hard Copy Games um, that just recently ships like their first game. And I think they've got a few more in production, but the, there's there's definitely more. Like I mentioned, there's other ones that are now kind of going, but just haven't got to the point of actually, you know, the, the initial production run happening kind of thing. Um, but I, th- I think because more and more people have seen the value maybe of, you know, people spend quite a lot on these companies like me being a, an example that a lot of people are sort of jumping up and saying, well, I could do that. I could run a company like this. So I think people are starting to get a bit more wary just because the, the market is getting watered down enough now that there's always the opportunity for someone to kind of act in bad faith and, and set something up because they, they think they're going to rake in this pre-order money and then kind of just disappear. Well, and that's, that's a good point is the pre-order stuff. So I think, I think most people, if they know about these, these uh, limited print run industries, they'll be most familiar probably with the the limited run games model which yeah. is we have made x number of games we're going to open up a time for you to buy it at whatever this local time is first come first serve no one gets more than two right so as yeah. a result of that yeah. you get people buying up stock and then immediately putting it on ebay for to, <laughs> to flip it for a profit yeah. Yeah. i do remember and it was when it was limited run. They put out one of the ease games, the YS, the ease, yes, whatever yeah. you say. That was an uh, an actual pre order game. They said we're opening pre orders for I think two weeks. Yeah, we're gonna make as many that are uh, as are pre ordered, and then and then that's it. They they're doing that more and more. What, what do these companies tend these other companies tend to do? Uh, do they do they do that 
we we have made five thousand in first come first serve. I mean, generally, or is there generally it, it's mm-hmm. kind of the model, like you say, that it's kind of we have X amount and we're selling through until they're gone and that's it. Um, limited run with all of their Switch games now and some of their biggest PS4 releases as well have been doing two week pre orders for quite a while now, and that's kind of I think it's taken the edge off of people kind of panicking and and jumping in with like the fear of missing out kind of thing and overspending for stuff on eBay. Because, you know, there's a, there's a slightly bigger stock of this stuff available most of the time. And most of the smaller companies still go, like I said, like the idea that we've got 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 copies. But there are some that, again, when, when they get hold of maybe a bigger license, say, okay, well, we'll, we'll do this as an open pre-order for a month or, or two weeks or something. So it, it kind of depends on, on the quality of the license a lot of the time, I think is what drives it. That, you know, you've got companies that are very small that are dealing with maybe really small indie developers and saying to them, okay, well, we'll license your game. We'll put out just a thousand copies and we'll see how it sells. But if it's like some of the Odd World games, for instance, that Limited Run have dealt with in the past, or I think Limited Run at the moment might still have a pre-order open for like the Power Rangers fighting game, which is obviously, you know, like a big business name kind of thing, that they've, they've started doing these kind of larger runs where it's just, okay, well, mm-hmm. it'll be open for a month. If you want one during that time, you can order as many as you want. And then at the end, it will still be limited because we'll we'll cap it at that point. But it does mean that print runs, I think, are going up from initially where it might have been a couple thousand Vita games when they started up to, I think, some of the big releases, like when they did uh, Celeste about a year ago. Uh, limited run, I think, printed or, or are said to have printed almost 20,000 copies of that. So, yeah, so it starts to approach almost like retail levels. Oh, really? No, just that it's, it's you know, times are changing a little bit because I think there is certainly an appetite for games like that, which are, you know, well well-reviewed, well-revered kind of thing. That, that people want physical copies of. So it's it's kind of, it's working in both ways that they're big enough now to, I think, support that model, whereas some of the smaller publishers maybe aren't there yet. Well, in that vein, do you think at this point, and I guess we're going to specifically talk about uh, Limited Run, they were, they were quite known. Their whole philosophy was, we're going to make 3,000 and we're never going to make this again. Yeah. With the kind of growth of interest in owning physical copies of these games, do you think they're actually hobbling themselves? Uh, significantly to to say that at this point I, to, it's really hard to say it's not like it's not like that doesn't happen in traditional retail yeah granted they'll come out as like game of the year versions but re-releases are not uncommon yeah in these I, traditional industries I, I think they probably are in certain cases like like i say, when it's a bigger name if they're still for instance uh, like releasing a ps4 game that's a print run of say three thousand copies i think they would always sell more they, they could up it by a couple thousand, no problem, and, and would probably sell through maybe just slightly slower. But I, th- I think they're still trying to balance the idea that, you know, they have these open pre-orders for Switch games, they have these open pre-orders for other big names. And I think just for their image, I think it probably pays to still have these ideas that this is this is really super limited. And, and it kind of keeps people sort of clicking and refreshing the site every Friday when things go up. So I think it's part of the business plan almost that they they could easily... Um, support and fund kind of more of, of every release they put out almost. But it, I think it benefits them to still have this idea of scarcity in, in some of their releases as well. It kind of sounds like like Nintendo. Remember when when there was that massive shortage of yeah. NES classics and, and people NES said classic. Nintendo... Yeah. Some people said Nintendo did it on purpose. Like they, they purposefully under yeah. underproduced. Do you think that's going on with any, any of these? I'm not just trying to single out Limited Run with any of these companies no i mean i think there's definitely there's a couple of companies like um one of the ones i mentioned uh i think it was strictly limited uh they, they've been running for quite a while now so they're reasonably well established but one of their earliest releases uh was a ps4 game called uh i think it was called griffin knight adventures or griffin knight something which was like a side-scrolling shoot 'em up and that got put up kind of as a, like a surprise drop of just a thousand copies and still sealed copies of that game now sell for two, three hundred pounds or, you know, more than that in dollars, um, which is insane because it's it's not that great a game. <laughs> like it's, it's one I bought at the time, got the platinum for. I did actually play that one properly, um, but it's nothing that I would say is worth spending that much to have on a shelf. And it, it's purely that idea of just scarcity. But I think they knew that it wasn't necessarily a big name. So we'll just go for a low number and hope that kind of pushes people to to spend out quickly. Yeah. Interesting. Do you, do you, as a collector, do you like, do you open these games and play them or is it important to you to keep them in their original packaging in? No, I, every time, if it's something I want to play, I I always open it. 
and and for me it's far less about the idea of having something that's really limited and more about having the ability to play it you know as as long as the disk drive is functioning <laughs> kind of thing because you know for all these things could potentially break in the future but it yeah. just feels like for me I, i'll have easier access to this stuff if i can pick a disk up off the shelf and put it in a machine in the future than yeah. if it was like i mentioned like think about something like pt the uh, hideo kojima mm. silent hills thing obviously that was that was on a storefront it was a, a download that people played and then if you deleted it that uh, it's gone because of licensing it's just it's not a thing anymore and even that for being something that i'm not hugely interested in like i mentioned with horror games it's it's not my area it, it makes me feel a bit funny when it's like well this was a big deal at the time and now it's a big deal that we we have no access to anymore uh, and, yes. and I think a lot of this, even if the games themselves aren't necessarily the best games or, or kind of like AAA things, I just like the idea that I've got like sort of preservation of this stuff that I can come back to. Yeah. And and maybe in one day in the same way now we can, you know, you, you can fit an entire NES library of ROMs on a, on a tiny memory stick. Mm. You know, in, in, you know, 10, 20 years, maybe things will happen in advance we made and we'll, we'll be able to kind of do that with, with more current consoles. But the kind of the rate of, of things like emulation for even like the PlayStation 2, is, is still kind of hobbled enough that I don't know how it will go now that, you know, so many of these, these concepts are tied to the idea of like digital rights management. And th- there's a lot more to kind of worry about in terms of, you know, what you're actually going to be able to have access to in the future. And having yes. these discs on a shelf just makes me feel that little bit safer. <laughs> yeah, no, I can, I can understand. With, with these sort of 3000 and like, you know, there, there's a whole range of games being put yeah. out there. Do you think, and I mean, this is obviously only speculation because we, we no do you think it's the same people though buying them all or do you think people do just drop in and go i want that one because i love that game i i think for the first probably like think about limited run the first maybe 100 releases they put out across all platforms i would say it was pretty much the same people week in week out um and it's only now they've kind of expanded in in kind of their market that i think you have a lot more kind of uh, like casual buyers who might say well actually that one thing is a game i really love and i want to get a copy yeah. of Whereas, you you know, you've still got the diehards like me that have almost picked up every release since launch, that it's kind of just having this huge library that makes me happy to see on a shelf. Um, yeah, yeah, whereas yeah. for others, like, like you mentioned, it's it could just be people saying, well, actually, that's a game I've got some connection to, or or that's a game that I, I really enjoyed playing and I'd like to be able to play it again in the future. So I, I, th- I think yeah. it's kind of the market's probably spread out a bit more than when it started. Uh, and certainly for the okay. amount of companies there are now, I, I I would be surprised if it was just kind of, a handful of people buying everything because otherwise surely everyone will be bankrupt. Like it's, it's just, <laughs> it's too big an industry now. Yes. You know, we talk about a, a cottage industry, but I think it's now it's kind of, a, it's like a village industry. We've, we've expanded enough that we've, we've got kind of yeah. a, a lot of different competitors now doing the same sort of thing. Okay. And look, I, I, you know, admittedly listeners, this is, this is way out of my, my knowledge area, but I'm going to ask this. I don't know if, if this is sort of common knowledge or if you know, or if, it, if nobody knows how this works, but how do, how do companies like Limited Run, how do they, do they just contact the developers to get the rights to do this? Or how does that sort I, of... I think, um, yeah, a, a lot of the time it's, it's these publishing companies will contact maybe smaller indie developers and work out yeah. a contract that basically just says, okay, we'll, we'll license that game for, you know, X amount of copies. And, and generally, I think once that print's been put out, the rights then go back to the individual developers because there, there has been a few examples where Limited Run have put out a game and obviously their policy is we, we don't reprint this stuff. But then a year later, Play Asia have picked up the same release in, in kind of a slightly tweaked format and put it out again. So th- there is kind of some crossover as well. So I, I think it's generally either, you know, the, the sort of the smaller developers being approached by these companies or now that it's of a bigger size, like Limited Run have just put out some Star Wars stuff. Like it's it's really sort of jumped up in terms of their profile that I think, you know, it's probably a lot easier to do a deal with Disney when you've got X amount of years of, of you know, proven sales yeah. record than at the beginning when you were probably, you know, sort of begging for scraps at the table to get some people to... To be with, with this, as you say, it's, it's becoming more and more popular, and obviously, it's popular because it is is limited in its scope. Do you think? Are you surprised that mm. none of the the major publishers have looked into this, or do you think this is it's just not enough, you know, profit for them, perhaps? Or I, I think that's probably a big thing. I, I think profit plays into it a lot. That uh, Microsoft, to this point, still haven't really partnered with any of these kind of companies because their their lowest print runs are so much bigger than Sony allows. So so Sony will let people print a thousand discs is is the lowest run you can do. Uh, And I think for the Switch, it might be like two and a half thousand or something is is Nintendo's lowest. 
Um, but for, for Microsoft, I think it's 10,000 as like a floor standard. And I, I think, you know, it makes it difficult. But for some of the bigger publishers, they could easily do this if they wanted to. But I, I do wonder if they're kind of looking at it and saying, well, you know, if we sell 3,000 copies, that's small potatoes. If we could just either keep it digital or, or publish this stuff in, in a much higher number. Okay. And then I have uh, two more questions. So, so you said you have a, quite a complete collection, but uh, I'm assuming not, uh, yeah. not, you're, you're not happy yet. There's still something that you're, you're chasing down. <laughs> is, is, there, is there a particular game that you've been on the hunt for? or the, what's, your, what's, your white, what's your white whale, Chris? Uh, there's a couple of Vita games. Like for some reason, the Vita sometimes on limited run especially has become like a real bloodbath. And, and I think because it is on its last legs that we know now there are, there are only X amount of Vita releases left from limited run. Mm. So each week it's getting harder and harder. And sometimes 2,000 cartridges will sell out in under 30 seconds. Like it, it's, it's become absolutely insane. Um, and I'm, I'm just waiting for him to name stuff that I own. Yeah. I mean, the, the two that I don't have for the Vita that I, I need to get a copy of is Night Trap got a release for the Vita. Um, that even though I do have a copy for the Switch, I, I would prefer one on the vita just because it's the handheld I, I love the most there was a physical copy of that there was a yeah. digital one yeah there was a physical <laughs> one and also for um iconoclasts the kind of uh 2d sort of action game uh that again it just sold out too quick for me uh and and this is from someone who you know has the whole sort of checkout process down to a fine art now for doing it for years uh that i still missed out so those two i kind of you know trawl through facebook groups and on ebay sometimes to see if a, a decent priced copy comes up um, because the, the Vita is kind of my most complete collection that I, I would love to have those last few. Yeah. Okay. And then I, I suppose you sort of answered by trolling through eBay and stuff, but have you, has there been any, any of them in the collection so far that you just come across randomly that you didn't expect? I don't know. In a, I mean, it would be way too early to say in a, a secondhand store, I'm sure, but mm. um, you, you've just acquired through a, you know, other, other means. Um, is it always? Not really. I think my, most of them have come direct from the publishers. I yeah. mean, there's been one or two times like in, in different cities, I think in like a, a visit to London once, uh, we have a chain of secondhand stores called CEX. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a copy of, I think, uh, one of the Oddworld games in their window that was a limited run print. So it, they are making their way around somehow. But I think the majority of people who are buying this stuff, if they're not just scalping it and then selling on straight away, generally are just holding on to this stuff. So yeah. maybe in the future when people sort of start to think, well, okay, I could thin out the collection and get rid of a few I didn't really like, that might be the time that in kind of five years, maybe we start to see them kind of trickle out a bit more than we have so far. Because none of, none of these are exclusive, right? Like no. it, it's one thing to have an exclusive publisher, but all of these games, no matter what company you're going to, these are all available digitally, right? Yeah. It's not, yeah. It's not like there's, you know, like I think GameStop had a, had a small handful of games uh, DS games, um, yeah. that that was the only way you could get it. Like it was not on the DS. Well, there wasn't a DS store. You know, later on they 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 published some games physically, but you could still buy them digitally, just from Sony. But if you wanted the disc, you had to go through GameStop. But yeah. I, I I recall there was one called like Maze. It was like a Professor Layton type game. It was called like Maze Memory of May, something like that. And uh, that was the only way you could get that game yeah. was specifically buying it at GameStop. So I, I think, yeah, I think if you if you buy these games, you're either going to scalp them or you're going to hold on to them for your collection. Because if you want to actually play them, you're not yeah. going to pay because yeah. generally when they come out digitally, they're cheaper, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Almost 100% yeah, yeah. of the time. <laughs> so, I mean, especially with some of the high ticket ones now, like certain games like early limited run games in, in terms of um, like value on, on the second hand market, their first Vita release that I, I picked up just by chance, which started off this whole collecting thing through these companies was um, like a, a tactical game called breach and clear. Oh, that was, a, that's a big seller, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my copy is open cause I've played it. So it, it hasn't got the same value, but that's like two, $300 now. And yet if you go on the, the PSN store, it's, maybe like two, three bucks, <laughs> you know, it's, it's nothing. So if you want to play the game, it's there. So it becomes purely about this idea of collection in the same way, I guess that, you know, say NES collectors, like you mentioned earlier, you can emulate this stuff. You could get a copy of any of the Mega Man games on, on like modern collections, but if people still want the cartridge, they, they pay obscene money sometimes. 
Can I ask a selfish question here? So you have, you, I'm sure yeah. you, you, you know, you buy digital as well. So you have all these games, you have, you know, whatever digital as well. So you have a huge library of games. How do you decide what to play? <laughs> uh, for, for some reason, I've mentioned this on, on my podcast before. I've, I've got like loads of great stuff. I've got games that I'm really excited to play one day. And, and for some reason, I often pick the worst stuff. And, and I don't know what it is. <laughs> I, I have kind of have a fascination with bad games sometimes. So it's, it's, it's often that if I see it's like a, it's a big release, it's a marquee release, they're the things I actually put to one side for a long time sometimes, almost to kind of ride yes. out the hype cycle. Uh, and and yeah. the stuff I end up playing is, is, I'm trying to think what I've played recently that's been not, not very good. Like, like so bad it's good or like just genuinely bad? Just not very good at all. Like, I mean, you know, think about the, the trophies I unlocked recently, that Tetraminos game is just a Tetris knockoff. And I, I love Tetris. It's one of my, my favorite franchises. I could sit down any time and play Tetris Effect on PlayStation VR. It's sat right next to me now. And yet I decided to pick up a game and spend more money to play it, regardless of what else is on the shelf, to play a terrible sort of Tetris knockoff that was a really miserable experience. So I, I don't know what it is that kind of uh, dictates what I choose. There's, there's no rhyme or reason, really. What a terrible affliction. I can't imagine what that's like at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, interesting. Yeah, good. Mindy, did you have any more any more questions? I, I think if I keep going, we're going we're gonna to go over quite a bit here. <laughs> we'll have to get, we'll have to get you hours. back on. We'll have another, we'll have another uh, three yeah. continent battle. Yeah, yeah, gladly. We will at some point. In fact, actually, I was thinking, depending on how today went, and I think it went quite well, but Chris might be sitting there grinding his teeth going, this will never happen again. <laughs> I don't know, but I think we should one day touch on the, the topic with two sort of, you know, artistically leaning people here of whether video games are art or not. So I'm going to talk to you in the future about that, and we can. Uh, I think that would be Absolutely. a fantastic topic uh, to really delve into. But look, you know, as we always do, listeners, we, we sully the, the intellectual conversation with the spam of the week. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm apologised for uh, to you chris for doing this because you know, right. it probably shocks you in many ways but <laughs> for mindy and i we're used to it now we're desensitized <laughs> so what we're going to do is we'll just throw out some games that we potentially think are, are coming that could be spam do you have anything for us mindy well we got the we got the weekly rat game which is uh yes. paradox soul we do and too, cj i know you're gonna play all three stacks because it's a it's rat publishing a metroidvania <laughs> Oh yes, I tell Ooh. you what the map is a joke. Five, five stacks. <laughs> yeah, it's a it, the map in this game is a nightmare. <laughs> but yeah, it's about twenty minutes, so it's a very short nightmare. So. <laughs> oh, you've played it. Oh, that's no fun. Yeah, yeah. Look, I have played it. I would recommend if you're going to play it, uh, and and you're you're, you're not going to do it yourself. If you're going to use a video guide, go with the iBad Driver guide. This time, it's really uh, it's quite easy to follow. Actually, quite impressive guide uh, as well. This one, yeah. Uh, we've also got that Cy- Siberian, the time traveling warrior. I see that's uh, got more stacks, huh? More stacks. <laughs> They're just making started up back stacks in 1995. Uh, yes. <laughs> No, 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 thank you. Uh, what else have we got there? Uh, is there anything else? Chris, did you see anything? I'm just having a little look. Did did they just release Attack of the Toy Tanks as well? Is that is that a rat game? Oh, yes, they did. The Asian version came out. Excellent game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, That's not that bad. I actually quite like that game. I know a lot of people got annoyed with the controls, but I don't know. It's all right. It's fine. I want to point out this isn't specifically spam. I think it's spam in a different way in terms of like how you would refer to it as shovelware. But Hitman Two, their trophy list got and still doesn't have a platinum. Uh, but their trophy list got so large they had to start another base list <laughs> for Hitman I didn't Two. I know that was possible because well because what they did was they 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 had the base list for Hitman Two and then the Hitman Two stuff, but then they ported over all of the trophies from hitman one as additional as like legacy dlc so as a result now that they're putting out more actual hitman two levels they've had to start a new base <laughs> list as dlc spillover so how, how does that even work I'm, I'm just i don't know how double lists work i didn't know that was a thing i have no idea how it works i don't know if it's a separate thing you got to download like a, a separate, um, um, what's the word I want? Like, ex- like executional, uh, um, like it's a separate program just called yeah. Hitman two additional expansions. And then they start adding DLC onto that, but you're not really playing off your Hitman two disc anymore or how that works. 
now that I think about it, I have no idea. I just think it's really, really funny that they went that far over. Yeah. That they need a separate base list to start building off of. Mm. And that there's was a still fantastic no pun there too. Thank you. Executional. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely dropped. <laughs> uh, well, I meant executable. I'm, I was oh, thinking okay. uh, computer terms. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. And then there's this grass cutter. What is this? Oh, yes. It's like a grass mowing cut. game, like a mowing simulator. <laughs> that's going to be up there with so bad it's good i think i would i'll probably love that game a new, a new favorite for everyone yeah i don't know it's it's going to be hard to top poop slinger man <laughs> do you have the platinum for that i do not i don't think there was a platinum anyway do you have the 100 percent then <laughs> no i haven't played it i just i i couldn't think of anything more let's let's say interesting than uh <laughs> than poop slinger yeah I'm going to throw out this fort, fort. It's either Bouillard or, or Boyard. I'm not sure. Uh, do you know this? It's apparently it's a TV show. I think in France, it's a bit like a, a bit like the American Ninja Masters or something show uh, that came out the other day. Oh, Ninja Warrior. Ninja Warrior. Sorry, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. Uh, came out. It came out a few months ago with a game. So this this game is like it's the same basically. It's a PS3 game on the PS4, uh, in in all its quality and. Uh, it's, it's, it is fantastically bad, but fantastically fun. I'm loving it. It's so great. It's so great. But that's only a 100% game, listeners. So you know, beware. Beware. Uh, that's quite a lot. I don't know. Another Devious Dungeon too. Look at that. Fantastic. What is with this, what is with this delay in Asian stacks? I don't know. There's a, there's a weird thing where, where Asia, stack, Asia stacks are coming out a couple weeks later. Or you get like Broken Sword Five and Late Shift. You get these Japanese stacks that are coming out years after the original game comes out. It's a good question. I mean, I mean, the develop- the publishers are probably wondering why people are buying multiple copies of these games. <laughs> 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 They're like, oh, we better find another region here. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Yeah, but look, there's plenty there. There's a game here that I've been meaning to play for a long time. Uh, this will a wonderful world it's a visual novel but it's it's sort of uh it's more than a visual novel i think it's also like an adventure uh puzzle game or whatever else so you know listeners if you happen to know anyone that's good at writing guides for these sort of games if you could hit me up and let me know and we could we could sort (laughs) something you know out like i don't know mindy if you if you knew anyone you know it's free dude what did i just say what did i just (laughs) say when i wrote the didalis walkthrough what did i just say about me and visual novels no this is will a wonderful world it's a totally different game yeah. You said visual novel with puzzles. <laughs> well, yeah, it was a misspoke. It's an adventure, adventure point and click game that sort of looks I like I hate you novel. so much. <laughs> we'll, we'll see what happens there. So, look, listeners, that is a, a ton of a ton of games there as well. That of Viva as well is fairly short as well, although that does look like high quality. And I look at that, a pick a picks color too. You'll 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 like those, don't you, Mindy? I do. I I, I feel like, and Chris, maybe you you do or don't know i still think the 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 one that nailed the controls the best was was nintendo's was picross the way that controls on the ds yeah yeah P- picross ds and picross all the the picross e series from the 3ds were the, the gold standard really for, for picross games everything else just feels wrong yeah i do know that this is this is literally just cut and paste the <laughs> trophy list from pick a pick's color one including the trophy tiles <laughs> that is lazy isn't it no it really is the trophy tiles the trophy values the trophy names and descri- it, it's the exact same list be the same puzzles <laughs> that sun looks familiar <laughs> yeah it's like is this even actually is this are they are they trying to pull a fast one here is this <laughs> are they just re-releasing the same game Maybe it's just a delayed <laughs> back. <laughs> I just gave, gave it a new name to to get around. Right. Any this, is how the, this is how the, this is the new new era of stacking. We'll just change the name, and put a two on it. <laughs> you can play all these games. No, again. it's bad enough when they did that with horror movies in the right. '80s. I don't want to see this in my video games now. I don't need alternate titles for everything to figure out what the hell I'm yeah, playing. Yeah. Well, well, look, we'll wait till next week. I'm sure that will be out. Uh, at some point and someone can can let us know so look listeners that is a ton of stuff today if you made it this far thank you so much for joining us it was a fantastic conversation i really enjoyed it and i would like to thank chris for joining us today no problem at all 
Yeah, thank you. I know it was a lot longer than you're used to, so you did fantastically well. <laughs> could, I, could I ask you, we've obviously mentioned the wonderful R3 Sense podcast, but if uh, people are trying to find you, where, where can they do that? Uh, the best place to find me is probably on Twitter. Uh, my Twitter handle is at Chaz underscore Hodges. Uh, no reason, I just found it funny once and it's stuck for years now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like that. Would you change it if you could? I don't think I would now. I mean, I mean, Chaz Hodges, this is a bit of obscure uh, UK trivia, uh, is, is the singer in an old kind of rock and roll sort of jamboree band called Chaz and Dave from about the 70s. Uh, and Chaz Hodges actually died about a year ago. So it's now like in memoriam <laughs> to, to my weird namesake who has uh, sadly passed away. But I'll, I'll keep the name going. Yeah, well, that's, that's fantastic. And, uh, and Mindy, where can we find you? Twitter at the mind is a city. Or uh, if you want to try out your guide writing chops, maybe for this will game that CJ clearly wants to play 20 minutes of with a walkthrough, uh, <laughs> hit me up over on PlayStationTrophies.org. I will help you through the process of learning how to write a trophy guide. Yeah, fantastic. And the show has a Twitter account as well, operated by the wonderful The Mind is a City. Uh, at- and CJ and cj <laughs> at push to plat the number two plat at push to plat the show is available on itunes podcast youtube soundcloud stitcher radio spotify and all those other things that i don't know how it got there uh but it's there <laughs> you know it's fantastic and uh look listeners what a week for games you know final fantasy 14 what else can i say that's where you should be that's where i should be hopefully i will be by next week uh and we will talk more but thank you as i said for listening to us thank you as always mindy and chris it was a pleasure thank you very much bye everyone